Chapter 7, Part 1 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joan Windle, Hampshire, Illinois. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz. Chapter 7 Religious Uses of Precious Stones, Pagan, Hebrew, and Christian. The use of stones for the decorations of images of the gods and in religious ceremonies, more especially in those connected with the burial of the dead, can be traced back to a remote antiquity. Indeed, we may regard this religious use of precious or peculiar stones as the natural development of the original idea of their talismanic virtue. If a certain supernatural essence manifested itself in the stone, what more fit object could be imagined for the decoration of statues of the gods? or to bear engraved texts from the sacred writings, and be placed with the bodies of the dead as passports to ensure the safe entry of the souls of the departed into the better land. While this employment of mineral substances for religious purposes is practically universal, the earliest recorded instances come from Egypt, and concern the Egyptian custom of engraving texts from a very ancient ritual composition called the Book of the Dead, upon certain semi-precious stones which had been cut into various symbolical forms. This Book of the Dead, composed of a number of distinct chapters, each complete in itself, describes the passage of the soul of the deceased through the realm of the dead, Amenti. Here the soul addresses the gods and other beings who receive it, and the prayers and invocations recited in the chapters are supposed to procure a safe passage and protection from all evil influences or impediments. One of the most unusual of the engraved amulets is the buckle or tie, Thet. This was generally of red jasper, carnelian, or red porphyry, or else of red glass or faience, or of sycamore wood. The wood was symbolical of the blood of Isis, and the amulets were sometimes engraved with the 156th chapter of the Book of the Dead. They were placed on the mummy's neck. The formula engraved reads, Chapter of the Buckle of Carnelian, which is put on the neck of the deceased. The blood of Isis, the virtue of Isis, the magic power of Isis, the magic power of the eye are protecting this the Great One. They prevent any wrong being done to him. This chapter is said on a buckle of carnelian dipped into the juice of Ankama, inlaid into the substance of the sycamore wood and put on the neck of the deceased. Whoever has this chapter read to him, the virtue of Isis protects him. Horus, the son of Isis, rejoices in seeing him, and no way is barred to him unfailingly. Another amulet is the Tet. The hieroglyph represents a mason's table, and the word signifies firmness, stability, preservation. These figures, made of faience, gold, carnelian, lapis lazuli, and other materials, were placed on the neck of the mummy to afford protection. The papyrus scepter, what, is usually cut from matrix emerald or made of faience of similar hue. What means verdure, flourishing, greenness. Placed on the neck of the mummy, it was regarded as emblematic of the eternal youth it was hoped the deceased would enjoy in the realm of the dead. In the 159th chapter of the Book of the Dead, we read of an what of matrix emerald. It was believed to be the gift of Thoth, serving to protect the limbs of the deceased. The amulet representing the pillow, Urs, was generally made of hematite. The 166th chapter of the Book of the Dead is sometimes engraved thereon. Dr. Budge renders this as follows. Rise up from non-existence, O prostrate one. They watch over thy head at the exalted horizon. Thou overthrowest thine enemies. Thou triumphest over what they do against thee, as Horus, the avenger of his father, this Osiris, has commanded to be done for thee. Thou cuttest off the heads of thine enemies, never shall they carry off from thee thy head. Verily, Osiris maketh slaughter at the coming forth of the heads of his enemies, may they never remove his head from him. Of all these amulets, the type most frequently encountered has the shape of a heart, ab. These are found of carnelian, green jasper, basalt, lapis lazuli, and other hard materials. 
The heart, regarded in ancient Egypt as the seat of life, was the object of a special care after death. Enclosed in a special receptacle, it was buried with the mummy, and the belief was that only after it had been weighed in the balance of the underworld against the symbol of law could it regain its place in the body of the deceased. The heart was symbolically represented by a scarab. A fine example of a heart amulet shows on one side the figure of the goddess Neith with the penu bird or phoenix, an emblem of the resurrection, and bears inscribed the chapter of the heart. The following extract from the Book of the Dead treats of the formula to be recited over a funeral scarab cut from a hard stone, perhaps the lapis lazuli. Egyptian tradition assigned this chapter to the reign of Semti, the fifth king of the first dynasty, about 4400 BC. Chapter of not allowing a man's heart to oppose him in the divine regions of the netherworld. My heart, which came from my mother, my heart necessary for my existence on earth, do not rise up against me. Do not testify as an adversary against me among the divine chiefs in regard to what I have done before the gods. Do not separate from me before the great lord of Amenti. Hail to thee, O heart of Osiris, dwelling in the west. Hail to you, gods of the braided beard, august by your scepter. Speak well of the Osiris, and make him prosper by Nebka. I am reunited with the earth. I am not dead in Amenti. There I am a pure spirit for eternity. To be said over a scarabaeus fashioned from a hard stone, coated with gold, and placed on the heart of the man after he has been anointed with oil. The following words should be said over him as a magic charm. My heart, which came from my mother, my heart is necessary for me in my transformations. Take your aliments, pass around the turquoise basin, and go to him who is in his temple, and from whom the gods proceed. The most ancient inscription of this especially favorite text is on the plinth of a scarab in the British Museum, bearing the cartouche of Sibak M. Saf, a king of the 14th dynasty, 2300 B.C. It is made from an exceptionally fine piece of green jasper, the body and head of the beetle being carefully carved out of the stone, while the legs are of gold carved in relief. The scarab is inserted into a gold base of tabloid form and was found at Kurna, Thebes, by Mr. Salt. As green jasper was believed to possess altogether exceptional virtues as an amulet, this particular scarab was probably regarded as especially sacred. It appears to have been the rule to engrave certain special chapters of the Book of the Dead, among those referring to the heart, upon particular stones. Thus, for instance, the 26th chapter was engraved on lapis lazuli, the 27th upon feldspar, the 30th upon serpentine, and the 29th upon carnelian. This may perhaps have been originally due to some association of the god principally invoked in the text with the precious substance upon which the text was engraved. The form of an eye, fashioned out of lapis lazuli and ornamented with gold, constituted an amulet of great power. It was inscribed with the 140th chapter of the Book of the Dead. On the last day of the month, Meshir, an offering of all things good and holy, was to be made before this symbolic eye, for on that day the supreme god Ra was believed to place such an image upon his head. Sometimes those eyes were made of jasper and could then be laid upon any of the limbs of a mummy. Of the image of truth made from a lapis lazuli and worn by the Egyptian high priest, Alien aptly says that he would prefer the judge should not bear truth about with him, fashioned and expressed in an image, but rather in his very soul. Among the Assyrian texts giving the formulae, for incantations and various magical operations, there is one which treats of an ornament composed of seven brilliant stones to be worn on the breast of the king as an amulet. Indeed, so great was the virtue of these stones that they were supposed to constitute an ornament for the gods also. The text, as rendered by Fossey, is as follows. Incantation The splendid stones, the splendid stones, the stones of abundance and joy, made resplendent for the flesh of the gods. The Hualini stone, the Sigaru stone, the Hulalu stone, the Sandu stone, the Uknu stone, the Dushu stone, the precious stone El Meshu, perfect in celestial beauty, the stone of which the Pingu is set in gold, placed upon the shining breast of the king as an ornament. Azaksud 
High Priest of Baal, make them shine, make them sparkle. Let the evil one keep aloof from the dwelling. The names of these two gems, the Hulalu and the Hulalini, suggest that they were of a similar class. As the fundamental meaning of the root once the names are formed is to perforate, it is barely possible that we have here the long-sought Assyrian designation for the pearl, which was commonly regarded in ancient times as a stone. In Arabic, the perforated pearl has a special name to distinguish it from the unperforated, or virgin pearl. All we know of the sandu is that it must have been a dark-colored stone. The uknu, however, is almost certainly the lapis lazuli. It is often mentioned in the Tel el Amarna tablets as having been among the gifts sent by the kings of Babylonia and Assyria to the pharaohs of Egypt, and also by the latter to friendly Asiatic monarchs. Of the Sirgaru and the Dushu stones, nothing is known, but the El Mashu, the seventh in the list, was evidently regarded as the most brilliant and splendid of all. Indeed, Professor Frederick Delich hazards the conjecture that it is the diamond. In any case, this stone must have been set in rings and considered very valuable, for in an Assyrian text occurs the following passage, Like an El Mashu ring, may I be precious in thine eyes. The fact that this stone is described as having a celestial beauty might incline us to believe that it was a sapphire. The idea of this mystic ornament composed of seven gems probably originated in Babylonia, where the number seven was looked upon as especially sacred. As we shall see, there is some reason to attribute a Hindu origin to the nine gems, the covering of the king of Tyre, enumerated by Ezekiel, while the breastplate on the ephod of the Hebrew high priest with its twelve stones, symbolizing the twelve months of the year, appears to be of later date and seems to belong to the time of the return from the Babylonian captivity and the building of the second temple. Certainly the historic and prophetic books of the Old Testament know nothing of it, although the Urim and Thummim are mentioned and the elaborate description given in Exodus is generally regarded by biblical scholars as belonging to the so-called priestly codex, the latest part of the Pentateuch, gradually evolved during the exile and given its final form in the 5th century. In the very ancient Assyrio-Babylonian epic narrative of the descent of the goddess Ishtar to Hades, the guardian of the infernal regions obliges the goddess to lay aside some part of her clothing and ornaments at each of the seven gates through which she passes. At the fifth, we are told that she stripped off her girdle of Aben Aladi, or stones which aided parturition. It has been asserted, and perhaps with some reason, that of the many mineral substances supposed to possess this virtue, jade, nephrite, or jadeite, was the earliest known. The Babylonian legends also tell of trees on which grow precious stones. In the Gilgamesh epic, a mystic cedar tree is described. This grew in the Elamite sanctuary of Arnina and was under the guardianship of the Elamite king Humbaba. Of this tree, an inscription relates, It produces Samtu stones as fruit. Its boughs hang with them, glorious to behold. The crown of it produces lapis lazuli. Its fruit is costly to gaze upon. Another tree bearing precious stones was seen by the hero Gilgamesh after he had passed through darkness for the space of twelve hours. This must have been a most resplendent object to judge from the following description on a cuneiform tablet. It bore precious stones for fruits. Its branches were glorious to the sight. The twigs were crystals. It bore fruit costly to the sight. One of the rarest and most significant specimens illustrating the use of valuable stones for religious ceremonial purposes in the pagan world is in the Morgan Tiffany collection. It is an ancient Babylonian axe head made of banded agate. So regular, indeed, is the disposition of the layers in this agate that one might be justified in denominating it an onyx. Its prevailing hue is what may be called a deer brown. Some white splotches now apparent are evidently due to the action of fire or that of some alkali. This axe head bears an inscription in archaic cuneiform characters and presumably in the so-called Sumerian tongue, that believed to have been spoken by the founders of the Babylonian civilization. The form of the inscription indicates that the object dates from an earlier period than 2000 BC. While the characters are clearly cut and can be easily deciphered, 
The inscription is nevertheless exceedingly difficult to translate. It is evident that the axe head was a votive offering to a divinity, probably on the part of a certain governor named, named Adagish. But whether the divinity in question was Shamash, the sun god, or the god Adad, or some other member of the Babylonian pantheon, cannot be determined with any finality. The French Assyriologist, François Lenormand, who first described this axe head in 1879, and Professor Ira Maurice Price of the Semitic Department of Chicago University, both admit that it may have been consecrated to Adad. As the weather god, the thunderer, the axe symbol would have been more especially appropriate to him in view of the usage, almost universal among primitive peoples, of associating stone axe heads or axe-shaped stones with the thunderbolt, and hence with the divinity who is believed to have launched it toward earth. The Sumerian axe head measures 134.5 millimeters in length, 5.3 inches, 35.5 millimeters in width, 1.4 inches, and 31 millimeters in thickness, 1.22 inches. It was originally secured by Cardinal Stefano Borgia, 1731 to 1804, for some time secretary of the College of the Propaganda in Rome, who probably acquired it from some missionary to the east. From the cardinal's family, it passed for 15,000 lira, $3,000, to the Tishkowitz collection, and when the objects therein comprised were disposed of at a public sale, the writer purchased it for the American Museum of Natural History in New York, April 16, 1902. In Alicante, in Spain, cut upon the pedestal of an ancient statue, supposed to have been that of Isis, was found an inscription giving a list of the offerings dedicated by divine command by a certain Fabia Fabiana in honor of her granddaughter. Evidently the fond grandmother had given of her best and choicest jewels which were used to adorn the statue. They consisted of a diadem set with a unio, a large round pearl, and six smaller pearls, two emeralds, seven barrels, two rubies, and a hyacinth. In each ear of the statue was inserted an ear ring, bearing a pearl and an emerald. About the neck was hung a necklace consisting of four rows of emeralds and pearls, eighteen of the former and thirty-six of the latter. Two circlets bound round the ankles contained eleven barrels and two emeralds, while two bracelets were set with eight emeralds and eight pearls. The adornment was completed by four rings, two bearing emeralds, while two, placed on the little finger, were set with diamonds. On the sandals were eight barrels. A notable instance of an antique votive offering is the necklace of valuable precious stones dedicated to the statue of Vesta. The Byzantine historian Zosimus attributes the tragic end of Stilicho's widow, Serena, to her having despoiled the image of Vesta of this costly ornament, and finds a sort of poetic justice in the manner of her death, since she was strangled by a cord which encircled her neck. End of chapter 7, part 1chapter 7 part 2 of the curious lore of precious stones this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the curious lore of precious stones by george frederick kuntz it is not only in the works of the fathers of the christian church that we find precious stones used as similes of religious virtue in buddhist writings also we have examples of this in the questions of King Melinda, composed perhaps as early as the third century of our era, occur the following passages. Just, O king, as the diamond is pure throughout, just so, O king, should the strenuous bhikshu, earnest in effort, be perfectly pure in his means of livelihood. This, O king, is the first quality of the diamond he ought to have. And again, O king, as the diamond cannot be alloyed with other substances, just so, O king, should the strenuous bhikshu, earnest in effort, never mix with wicked men as friends. This, O king, is the second quality of the diamond he ought to have. And again, O king, just as the diamond is set together with the most costly gems, just so, O king, should the strenuous bhikshu, earnest in effort, associate with those of the highest excellence, with men who have entered the first or second or third stage of the noble path. 
with the jewel treasures of the Erhats, of the recluses of the threefold wisdom, or of the sixfold insight. This, O king, is the third quality of the diamond he ought to have. For it was said, O king, by the Blessed One, the God over all gods, in the Sata Nipata. Let the pure associate with the pure, ever in recollection firm, dwelling harmoniously wise, thus shall ye put an end to griefs. The description of the New Jerusalem in the Book of Revelations finds a curious parallel in the Hindu Puranas. Here we are told that the divine Krishna, the eighth incarnation of Vishnu, took up his abode in the wonderful city of Devaraka, and was visited there by the various orders of gods and geniuses. Gods, Asuras, Gandharas, Kinaras, began to pour into Dwaraka to see Krishna and Valarama. Some descended from the sky, some from their cars, and alighting underneath the banyan tree, looked on Dwaraka the matchless. The city was square, it measured a hundred yojonas, and over all was decked in pearls, rubies, diamonds, and other gems. The city was high, it was ornamented with gems, and it was furnished with cupolas of rubies and diamonds, with emerald pillars and with courtyards of rubies. It contained endless temples. It had crossroads decked with sapphires and highways blazing with gems. It blazed like the meridian sun in summer. As compared with the description in Revelations, we cannot fail to note the lack of definiteness. Instead of the well-ordered scheme of color as represented by the twelve precious stones dedicated to the twelve tribes of Israel, the mystic Hindu city is simply a gorgeous mass of the most brilliant gems known in India. The poetic description of the royal city Kusavati, given in the Maha Sudasana Sutanta, may perhaps have originated in some tradition regarding Ekbatana or at Babylon. Seven ramparts surrounded Kusavati, the materials being respectively gold, silver, beryl, crystal, agate, coral, and, for the last, all kinds of gems. In these ramparts were four gates, one of gold, one of silver, one of crystal, and one of jade, and at each gate seven pillars were fixed, each three or four times the height of a man, and composed of the seven precious substances that constituted the ramparts. Beyond the ramparts were seven rows of palm trees, the fourth row, having trunks of silver and leaves and fruit of gold. Then followed palms of beryl, with leaves and fruit of beryl, agate palms whose fruit and leaves were of coral, and coral palms, with leaves and fruit of agate. Lastly, the palms whose trunks were composed of all kinds of gems, had leaves and fruits of the same description. And when these rows of palm trees were shaken by the wind, arose a sweet sound, and pleasant, and charming, and intoxicating. In Greek literature, also, there is a gem city, namely the city of the islands of the blessed, described by Lucian in his Vera Historia. The walls of this city were of emerald, the temples of the gods were formed of beryl, and the altars therein of single amethysts of enormous size. The city itself was all of gold as a fit setting for these marvelous gems. Hindu mythology tells of a wonderful tank formed of crystal, the work of the god Maya. Its bottom and sides were encrusted with beautiful pearls, and in the center was a raised platform blazing with the most gorgeous precious stones. Although it contained no water, the transparent crystal produced the illusion of water, and those who approached the tank were tempted to plunge into it and take a refreshing bath in what appeared to be clear, fresh water. The Kalpa tree of Hindu religion, a symbolical offering to the gods, is described by Hindu poets as a glowing mass of precious stones. Pearls hung from its boughs, and beautiful emeralds from its shoots. The tender young leaves were corals, and the ripe fruit consisted of rubies. The roots were of sapphire, the base of the trunk diamond, the uppermost part of cat's eye, while the section between was of topaz. The foliage, except the young leaves, was entirely formed of zircons. The Chinese Buddhist pilgrim Huan Tseng, who visited India between 629 and 645 AD, tells of the wonderful diamond throne, which according to the legend had once stood near the tree of knowledge beneath whose spreading branches 
Gautama Buddha is said to have received his supreme revelation of truth. This throne has been constructed in the age called the Kalpa of the Sages. Its origin was contemporaneous with that of the earth, and its foundations were at the center of all things. It measured 100 feet in circumference and was made of a single diamond. When the whole earth was convulsed by storm or earthquake, this resplendent throne remained immovable. Upon it the thousand Buddhas of the Kalpa had reposed and had fallen into the ecstasy of the diamond. However, since the world has passed into the present and last age, sand and earth have completely covered the diamond throne, so that it can no longer be seen by human eyes. In the Kalpa Sutra, written in Prakrit, one of the sacred books of the Jains, the rivals of the Buddhists, it is said that Haranagamisi, the divine commander of the foot troops, seized fourteen precious stones, the chief of which was Vajra, the diamond, and rejecting their grosser particles, retained only their finer essence to aid him in his transformations. In the same sutra, the following glowing description is given of the adornment of the surpassingly beautiful goddess Shri. On all parts of her body shone ornaments and trinkets composed of many jewels and precious stones, yellow and red gold. The pure cup-like pair of her breasts sparkled, encircled by a garland of kunda flowers in which glittered a string of pearls. She wore strings of pearls made by clever and diligent artists, strung with wonderful strings, a necklace of jewels with a string of dinars, and a trembling pair of earrings touching her shoulders diffused a brilliancy. But the united beauties and charms of these ornaments were only subservient to the loveliness of her face. As engraved decoration of a fine Chinese vase of white jade with delicate crown markings, appear eight storks, each of which bears in its beak an attribute of one of the eight Taoist immortals. Thus we have the double gourd as attribute of the most powerful of these demigods, known as Li with the iron crotch, whose aid is sought by magicians and astrologers. The magic sword with which Lu Tong Pin vanquished the spirits of evil that roamed through the Chinese empire in the form of terrible dragons. The basket of flowers, attribute of Lan Tsai Ho, the patron of gardeners and florists. The royal fan used by Han Chongli of the Chao dynasty, 1122 to 220 BC, to call again to life the spirits of the departed. The lotus flower, emblematic of the virgin Ho Xian Ku, venerated somewhat as a patron saint by Chinese housewives, and who acquired the gift of immortal life by the help of a powder of pulverized jade and mother of pearl. The bamboo tubes and rods with which the mighty necromancer Cheng Kuo, patron of artists, evoked the souls of the dead, flute of the musician's patron Han Tsiang Tzu, who owed his immortality to his craft in stealthily entering the Taoist paradise and securing a peach from the sacred tree of life, and lastly, the castanets of Cao Kuo Chin, especially revered by Chinese actors. The prevailing belief in India that treasures offered to the images or shrines of the gods will bring good fortune to the generous donor finds expression in many ancient and modern Hindu writings. In the Rig Veda, it is said that by giving gold, the giver receives a life of light and glory. In the Samaveda Upanishad, we read, Givers are high in heaven. Those who give horses live conjointly with the sun. Givers of gold enjoy eternal life. Givers of clothes live in the moon. Another text, Haiti Smriti, reads, Coral and worship will subdue all three worlds. He who worships Krishna with rubies will be reborn as a powerful emperor. If with a small ruby, he will be born a king. Offering emeralds will produce Guyana or knowledge of the soul and of the eternal. If he worships with a diamond, even the impossible or nirvana, that is, eternal life in the highest heaven, will be secured. If with a flower of gold a man worships for a month, he will get as much wealth as Kuvera, the lord of rubies, and will hereafter attain to nirvana and to Muskwa or salvation. At Multan, one of the most ancient cities of India, situated in the Punjab, 
a hundred and sixty-four miles southwest of Lahore, there was in the Hindu temple an idol having for eyes two great pearls, the eyes of the rude image of Jagannath at Puri in Bengal, Orissa, are said to have at one time been formed of precious stones, as were also those of the idols of Vishnu at Chandranagor and in the great seven-walled temple at Srirangam, whence appears to have come the Orloff diamond. In ceremonial worship the Hindus recognize sixteen offerings, the ninth consisting of gems and jewelry, and a divine assurance of adequate return to the giver appears in the Bhagavat Purana, where Krishna says, Whatever is best and most valued in this world, and that which is most dear to you, should be offered to me, and it will be received back in immense and endless quantity. On certain appointed days the holy images are decorated with the choicest garments and the richest jewelry in the temple treasury. This is especially the case on the day celebrated as the birthday of the respective divinity. However, the gifts are believed to retain their sacred character as dedicated objects only for a comparatively brief period, varying from a month or more for garments and vestments to ten or twelve years for jewels, such as the Naratna or the Pantaratna, the prized and revered jewels, composed respectively of nine and five gems. The Pantaratna usually consists of gold, diamond, sapphire, ruby, and pearl. After the gifts have ceased to be worthy of use in the temples, they may be disposed of to defray the expenses of the foundation, including the cost of supporting the numerous priests and attendants. As the objects still retain their sacred associations, they are eagerly bought by pious Hindus, who undoubtedly regard them as valuable talismans. Thus they not only serve to bring blessings upon the donors, but also constitute one of the chief sources of income for the temples. One of the oldest and perhaps the most interesting talismanic jewel is that known as the Nairatna or Naratna, the Nine Gem Jewel. It is mentioned in the old Hindu Ratnakastras or treatises on gems, for example, in the Naratna Pariksha, where it is described as follows Manner of composing the setting of a ring. In the center, the sun, the ruby. To the east, Venus the diamond, to the southeast, the moon, the pearl, to the south, Mars, the coral, to the southwest, Rahu, the jacinth, to the west, Saturn, the sapphire, to the northeast, Jupiter, the topaz, to the north, the descending node, the cat's eye, to the northwest, Mercury, the emerald. Such is the planetary setting. From this description we learn that the jewel was designed to combine all the powerful astrological influences. The gems chosen to correspond with the various heavenly bodies, and with the aspects known as the ascending and descending nodes, differ in some cases from those selected in the West. For instance, the emerald is here assigned to Mercury, whereas in Western tradition this stone was usually the representative of Venus, although it is sometimes associated with Mercury also. On the other hand, the diamond is dedicated to Venus, instead of to the sun, as in the Western world. In the Naratna, the five gems known to the Hindus as the Maharatnani, or great gems, the diamond, pearl, ruby, sapphire, and emerald, were, as we see, associated with the sun and moon, Venus, Mercury, and Saturn. While the four lesser gems, Uparatnani, namely the jacinth, topaz, cat's eye, and coral represent Mars, Jupiter, Rahu, and the descending node. The two last named are very important factors in astrological calculations and are often called the dragon's head and the dragon's tail. These designations signify the ascending and descending nodes, indicating the passage of the ecliptic by the moon in her ascent above and descent below this arbitrary plane. In three somewhat obscure passages of the Rig Veda, there are references to the seven Ratnas. Whether these were gems cannot be determined since the primary meaning of the word Ratna is a precious object, not necessarily a precious stone. But it is possible that we may have here an allusion to some earlier form of talisman in which only the sun, moon, and the five planets were represented. It is easy to understand that such a talisman as the Naratna 
combining the favorable influences of all the celestial bodies supposed to govern the destinies of man, must have been highly prized, and we may well assume that only the rich and powerful could own this talisman in a form ensuring its greatest efficacy. For the Hindus believed that the virtue of every gem depended upon its perfection, and they regarded a poor or defective stone as a source of unhappiness and misfortune. In modern times, this talisman is sometimes differently composed. A specimen shown in the Indian court of the Paris Exposition of 1878 consisted of the following stones, coral, topaz, sapphire, ruby, flat diamond, cut diamond, emerald, amethyst, and carbuncle. Here, the cut diamond, amethyst, and carbuncle take the place of the jacinth, pearl, and cat's eye. Instead of uniting the different planetary gems in a single ring, they have sometimes been set separately in a series of rings to be worn successively on the days originally named after the celestial bodies. We read in the life of Apollonius of Tyana, 1st century A.D., by Philostratus, Damis also relates that Iarchus gave to Apollonia seven rings named after the planets, and the latter wore these one by one in the order of the weekdays. Although it is not expressly stated that the appropriate stones were set in the rings, the custom of the time makes it probable that this was the case. Among the Burmese, the value for occult purposes of the nine gems composing the Neoratna or Naratna is strictly determined in the following order. First, the ruby. Second, the diamond, or rock crystal. Third, the pearl. Fourth, the coral. Fifth, the topaz. Sixth, the sapphire. Seventh, the cat's eye. Eighth, the amethyst. And ninth, the emerald. That the ruby, diamond, and pearl should occupy places of honor is quite natural. But the relegation of the sapphire to sixth place after coral and topaz seems to be a rather unfair treatment of this beautiful stone. End of chapter 7, part 2. Recording by Joan Windle, Hampshire, Illinois. Chapter 7, part 3 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz. The yellow girdles worn by the Chinese emperors of the Manchu dynasty were variously ornamented with precious stones according to the different ceremonial observances at which the emperor presided. For the services in the Temple of Heaven, the very appropriate choice of lapis lazuli ornaments was made. For the altar of earth, yellow jade was favored. For a sacrifice on the altar of the sun, the gems were red corals, while white jade was selected for the ceremonies before the altar of the moon. Jade of different colors was used for the six precious tablets employed in the worship of heaven and earth and the four cardinal points. For the worship of heaven, there was the dark green round tablet. For that of earth, an octagonal tablet of yellow jade. The east was worshipped with a green pointed tablet. The west was worshipped with the white tiger tablet. The north with a black semicircular tablet. And the south with a tablet of red jade. Of all the Chinese works on jade, the most interesting and remarkable is the Kuyu Toyu Pu, or Illustrated Description of Ancient Jade. A catalog divided into a hundred books and embellished with upward of seven hundred figures. It was published in 1176 and lists the magnificent collection of jade objects belonging to the first emperor of the Southern Sung Dynasty. One of the treasures here described was a four-sided plaque of pure white jade over two feet in height and breadth, and it was regarded as of altogether exceptional value, for on it was a design miraculously engraven. This was a figure seated on a mat with a flower vase on its left and an alms bowl on the right, in the midst of rocks enveloped in clouds. The figure was an image of the Buddhist saint, Samanta Bahadra, and the plaque is said to have been washed out of a sacred cave in the year 1068 by a violent and mysterious current. Jade talismans are very popular at the present day in the Mohammedan world, and among the Turks they are so highly prized as heirlooms that it is difficult to secure any of them. There is an orthodox Mohammedan sect whose members call themselves Pekdash, 
and who, during their whole lifetime, carry about with them a flat piece of jade as a protection against injury or annoyance of every kind. The four rain-making gods are shown wearing necklaces of coral and turquoise in the ceremonial sand paintings of the Navajos. These four gods are respectively colored to denote the four cardinal points, black for north, blue for south, yellow for west, and white for east. The whole painting, measuring 9 by 13 feet, is guarded on three sides by magic wands. Toward the east it is left unprotected, as only good spirits are believed to dwell in this direction. Each of the rain gods carries suspended from his right wrist an elaborately decorated tobacco pouch, bearing the figure of a stone pipe. The Navajos believe that in this pouch the god places a ray of sunlight with which he lights his pipe. When he smokes, clouds form in the sky and the rain descends. In the sand picture representing the god of the whirlwind, this divinity also wears ear pendants and a necklace of turquoise. Of the turquoise in Aztec times, we have the testimony of the missionary Bernardino de Sahagan that one variety, presumably that regarded as the finest and most attractive, bore the name Tuxivitl, which signified turquoise of the gods. No one was allowed either to own or wear this, as it was exclusively devoted to the service of the gods, whether as a temple offering or for the decoration of the divine images. Sahagan describes this turquoise as fine, unspotted, and very clear. It was very rare and was brought to Mexico from afar. Some specimens were of rounded shape, like a hazelnut cut in half. Others were broad and flat, and some were pitted as though in a state of decomposition. The god of fire, Jayutukatli, or Ishsokokwi, presided over the ceremony of piercing the ears of the young boys and girls. The image of this god was decorated with earrings encrusted with a mosaic of turquoise. He held in his left hand a buckler on which were five large green stones called chalchitl, jadeite, placed in the form of a cross on a plate of gold almost covering the shield. At the time of the Spanish conquest, an immense emerald, almost as large as an ostrich egg, was adored by the Peruvians in the city of Manta. This emerald goddess bore the name of Uminya, and, like some of the precious relics of the Christian world, was only exhibited on high feast days, when the Indians flocked to the shrine from far and near, bringing gifts to the goddess. The wily priests especially recommended the donation of emeralds, saying that these were the daughters of the goddess, who would be well pleased to see her offspring. In this way, an immense store of emeralds rewarded the efforts of the priests, and on the conquest of Peru, all these fine stones fell into the hands of Pedro de Alvarado, Garcilaso de la Vega, and their companions. The mother emerald, however, had been so cleverly concealed by the priests of the shrine that the Spaniards never succeeded in gaining possession of it. Many of the other emeralds were destroyed because of the ignorance and stupidity of some of their new owners, who, supposing that the test of a true emerald was its ability to withstand hard blows, laid the stones on an anvil and hammered them to pieces. The old and entirely false notion that the genuine diamond could endure this treatment may have suggested the unfortunate test. Garcilaso likens the growth of the emerald in its mine to that of a fruit on a tree, and he believed that it gradually acquired its beautiful green hue, that part of the crystal nearest the sun being the first to acquire color. He notes an interesting specimen found in Peru, half of which was colorless like glass, while the other half was a brilliant green. This he compares with a half-ripened fruit. The remarkable jade adze, generally known as the Kunz adze, was found in Oaxaca, Mexico, brought to the United States about 1890, and is now in the American Museum of Natural History, New York. Of a light greenish-gray hue with a slight tinge of blue, this jade artifact is 272 millimeters long, 10 and 13 sixteenths inches, 153 millimeters wide, 6 inches, and 118 millimeters thick, 4 and 5 eighths inches. Its weight is 229.3 troy ounces, nearly 16 pounds of avoirdupois. Rudely, but not unskillfully, 
Carved upon its face is a grotesque human figure. Four small, shallow depressions, one under each eye and one near each hand, may have served to hold in place small gold films, but no trace of gold decoration is now extant. In its mechanical execution, this adds offers evidence of considerable skill on the part of the Aztec lapidary, the polish equaling that of modern workers. In the fact that a large piece, which must apparently have weighed at least two pounds, has evidently been cut out of this implement by some one of its Indian owners, we can see a proof of the talismanic power ascribed to jadeite in Aztec times, for there can be little doubt that nothing less than a belief in the great virtue of jadeite, coupled with the rarity of the material, could have induced the mutilation of what must have been regarded in its time as a remarkable work of art. The source of the prehistoric jade, nephrite and jadeite, found in Europe, and also of that worked into ornaments by the Indians before the Spanish conquest of America, was long the subject of contention among mineralogists and archaeologists. In Germany, this question was denominated the nephritfrage, and the most notable contribution to the discussion was the great scientific and scholarly work issued by Heinrich Fischer. His conclusion was that as there was no evidence of the existence of these minerals outside of a few localities in Asia, the European and American supply must have been brought to these parts of the world from Asia, and that hence the presence of these jade artifacts in America clearly pointed to commercial intercourse at an early period between the American continent and Asia, and might be regarded as offering a strong argument in favor of an Asiatic origin for an American civilization. According to this theory, the prehistoric jade objects found in Europe must have had a similar source and would constitute a proof of the existence of traffic with remote points in Asia at a date long previous to that commonly accepted. This view was strongly opposed by Professor A. B. Meyer of Dresden, and recent discoveries have effectively disproved the theory in the case of Europe, at least, for nephrite has been found there in situ in several places. The largest mass of this material that has been taken from a European deposit is that found by the writer Jordan Smul in Silesia in April 1899, and which weighed 4,704 pounds. The origin of American jade in the forms of nephrite and jadeite has not yet been determined, but we have every reason to suppose that deposits of these minerals will eventually be discovered in various parts of the American continent, as they have already been in Europe. Indeed, the existence of nephrite in Alaska is already well attested. The peculiar and characteristic qualities of these substances have made them favorite materials for ornamental objects from the earliest ages down to our own day, and in almost all parts of the world. A most important element contributing to the popularity of jade has been its supposed possession of wonderful talismanic and therapeutic virtues. And while the Western world has not the same belief in these matters as the Eastern world, a more or less definite appreciation of what jade still signifies for many in the Orient continues to exercise an influence over both Americans and Europeans, making objects of nephrite or jadeite highly prized everywhere at the present time. The term chalchihuitl was indifferently applied by the ancient Mexicans to a number of green or greenish-white stones, quetzal chalchihuitl, which was regarded as the most precious variety, may perhaps have been more exclusively denoted jadeite. This is somewhat indefinitely described by Sahagun as being white with much transparency and with a slight greenish tinge, something like jasper. Of eight ornamental objects of green stone examined some years ago by the writer, four were of jadeite, one of serpentine, another of green quartz, and the remaining two of a mixture of white feldspar and green hornblende. An inferior kind of chalchuil said by Sahogan to have come from quarries in the vicinity of Tecalco, appears to have been identical with the so-called Mexican onyx, which is found in veins in that place and is an aragonite stalagmite. This material from which figures, ornaments, and beads were made by the ancient Mexicans is today greatly valued as an ornamental stone.
The greater number of ancient Mexican jadeite beads appear to have been rounded pebbles of this material, assorted as to size, and drilled for use in making necklaces. Other green stones used at this time in Mexico were green jasper, green plasma, serpentine, and also the Tecalco onyx, or marble above mentioned. In many cases, these substances are of such rich green that they might easily be mistaken for jadeite by those who lack the tests or the experience at the command of modern mineralogists. Should jadeite ever be found in situ in Mexico, it seems probable that the discovery will be made in the state of Oaxaca, whence came the finest ancient specimens, including the splendid votive ads. Moreover, one of the few materials by which jadeite can be worked is furnished by the streams of this region, whence have been taken several rolled pebbles, which the writer has identified as yellow and blue corundum, the quality being equal to that of specimens from Ceylon. Gessner describes one of the lip ornaments worn by the Aborigines of South America in the following words, a green stone or gem which the inhabitants of the West Indies use. They pierce their lips and insert this stone so that the thicker part adheres to the hole and the rest protrudes. We might call these ornaments ora penduli, mouth pendants. This stone was given me by a learned Piedmontese, Johannes Ferrarius, and he wrote of it as follows. I send a cylindrical green stone as long as a man's middle finger, and having at one extremity two ridges. It is stated that the Brazilians of high rank wore these from their youth in their pierced lips, one or more being worn according to the dignity of the wearer. While eating, or whenever they so wish for any other reason, these ornaments are removed from the lips. Similar ornaments made of a green quartz and of beryl are in the Kunz collection in the Field Museum of Chicago. The reason for these strange mutilations, which often cause serious discomfort to those who practice them, is not at all easy to determine. Some have conjectured that by the insertion of bright colored objects in the ears, nose, and lips, members of the same tribe were enabled to recognize each other at a distance, each tribe having selected a particular color. However, although certain local preferences are shown in the matter of color or material, there is no hard and fast rule in this matter, and frequently neighboring tribes will employ stones or shells of the same or similar hue and appearance. Others find in this custom a religious significance and suppose that the mutilation represents a form of sacrifice to the spirits, good or bad, who must be rendered favorable to man by some act on his part, showing his unconditional submission to them. Originating in this way, the idea of adornment was a secondary impulse. It is a fact that ancient peoples regarded the wearing of earrings as a badge of slavery, and according to rabbinical legend, Eve's ears were pierced as a punishment for her disobedience when she was driven from the Garden of Eden. A curious theory was advanced by Knopf. He calls attention to the habit children have of thrusting small bright objects into their noses and ears, and suggests that this indicates a natural propensity, which, coupled with the early developed love of adornment, induced primitive man to affix ornamental objects on or in the nose, ear, or mouth. There may be more in this than we are willing to admit, but on the whole it seems most probable that ceremonial and religious considerations give rise to the custom. One of the largest masses of sculptured Chinese jade is in the collection of T.B. Walker, Esquire, of Minneapolis. This shows a jade mountain with groups of figures artistically placed at its base and winding pathways up to its summit. On the face of the rock is inscribed in beautiful Chinese characters the Epidendron Pavilion Essay of Wang Haichi, a masterpiece of Chinese calligraphy. An enormous mass of New Zealand jade, Punamu, green stone, weighing 7,000 pounds, found in South Island in 1902, is to be seen in the Museum of Natural History, New York. It was secured by the writer and was donated to the museum by the late J. Pierpont Morgan. This is the largest mass of jade known of which we have any record. On it is placed a remarkable and in its own peculiar way an artistic decoration serving as a type of old Maori life 
and at the same time designating the geographic source of the jade in a striking and unmistakable manner calculated to appeal to the least intelligent visitor. This is a statue of a Maori warrior of the old days, executing a war dance, characteristics of which were a distortion of the features and a thrusting out of the tongue intended to express defiance and contempt of the enemy. The time or cadence of the dance was marked by slapping the thigh with the flat of the left hand. This figure was executed from life by Sigurd Neandros. Indeed, it was actually cast from the model, so that there can be no doubt as to its fidelity. Rock crystal is included among the various objects used as fetishes by the Cherokee Indians. This stone is believed to have great power to give aid in hunting and also in divining. One owner of such a crystal kept his magic stone wrapped up in buckskin and hid it in a sacred cave. At stated intervals, he would take it out of its repository and feed it by rubbing over it the blood of a deer. This goes to prove that the stone, as a fetish, was considered to be a living entity and, as such, to require nourishment. End of chapter 7, part 3. Recording by Joan Wendell, Hampshire, Illinois. Chapter 7, Part 4 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kunz. Chapter 7, Part 4. Religious Uses of Precious Stones, Pagan, Hebrew, and Christian Precious stones have been everywhere regarded as especially appropriate offerings at the shrine of a divinity, for the worshipper naturally thought that what was most valuable and beautiful in his eyes must also be most pleasing to the divinity he worshipped. However, we rarely find the usage which was remarked by Francisco López de Gomara among the Indians of New Granada about the time of the Spanish conquest. These natives burned gold and emeralds before the images of the sun and moon, which were regarded as the highest divinities. Certainly, to use precious stones for a burnt offering was an original and curious idea, although we have abundant proof that pearls were offered in this way by the mound builders of the Mississippi Valley. In this case, great quantities of pearls were burned at the obsequies of the chiefs of the tribes, or at those of any one belonging to the family of a chief. In ancient Mexico, the lapidaries adored the four following divinities as their tutelary gods. Chico Naui Itzcuintli, Nine Dogs, Nahuel Pili, Noble Necromancer, Macuil Cali, Five Horses, and Sintectil, the God of Harvest. A festival was celebrated in honor of the three last-named divinities when the zodiacal sign called Chico Naui Itzquintli was in the ascendant. A feminine divinity represented this sign, and to her was attributed the invention of the garments and the ornaments worn by women. The four gods of the lapidaries were looked upon as the discoverers and teachers of the art of cutting precious stones and of piercing and polishing them, as well as of the making of labrets and ear flaps of obsidian, rock crystal, or amber. They also were the inventors of necklaces and bracelets. The stones worn by Chinese mandarins as a designation of their rank were undoubtedly determined originally by religious or ceremonial considerations. They are as follows. It will be noticed that red stones are given the preference. Red or pink tourmaline, ruby, and rubellite, first rank. Coral or an inferior red stone, garnet, second rank blue stone, beryl or lapis lazuli, third rank, rock crystal, fourth rank, other white stones, fifth rank. 
the knowledge of classical mythology was so slight among the ecclesiastics of the middle ages that some very queer attributions of the subjects engraved on greek and roman gems were made during this period a reliquary containing a tooth of the apostle peter preserved in the cathedral of troy was set with antique gems which had been plundered by french and venetian crusaders from the treasure house of the greek emperor in constantinople when that city was sacked in twelve o four during the fourth crusade among these gems was one representing leda and the swan certainly a curious subject for the adornment of a christian reliquary another greek or roman gem long preserved in a church was furnished by its christian owners with an inscription indicating that the figure engraved upon it was that of st michael while in reality it was a representation of the god mercury still another gem was provided with an inscription signifying that the subject was the temptation of mother eve in the garden of eden but the greek gem engraver's intent had been to carve the figures of zeus and athena standing before an olive tree a design which appears on some athenian coins at the feet of the divinities appears a serpent in a similar way the grain measure crowning the head of jupiter serapis led to the attribution of a gem so engraved to the patriarch joseph an engraved amethyst bearing the figure of a little cupid is said to have been worn in a ring by st valentine while this may be somewhat doubtful it is by no means impossible for many pagan gems were worn by pious christians who reconciled their consciences to the use of these beautiful but scarcely religious ornaments by giving to the pagan symbols a christian meaning certainly in view of the time-honored customs connected with st valentine's day there seems something peculiarly appropriate in the design of the ring supposed to have been worn by st valentine that precious stones had sense and feeling was quite generally believed in medieval times and a legend told of st martial illustrates this idea the gloves worn by this saint were studded with precious stones and when on a certain occasion a sacrilegious act was committed in his presence the gems horrified at the sight sprang out of their settings and fell to the ground before the eyes of the onlookers the St. Sylvester or St. James stone is a banded agate in two colors, the one dark and the other light, with a cat's eye effect so that both colors are equally visible. The light side represents the old year with its known occurrences, and the opaque side represents the new year which is dark like futurity this is a typical stone for a new year's present or for one born on st sylvester's day the last day of the year the popular tradition is that the member of a family or a household who is last to arise on that day will be the last to arise all the year around the famous sacro catino preserved in genoa was long believed to be made of a single immense emerald but careful investigation proved that it was of no more valuable material than green glass. A legend still current in the early part of the 16th century represented this cup or dish as having been used by Christ at the Last Supper, and stated that it was one of the utensils which King Herod ordered to be brought from Galilee to Jerusalem for the celebration of the Paschal Feast, but his purpose having been changed by divine providence, he made other use of it. A queer story has been told regarding the Genoese emerald. At one time, when the government was hard-pressed for money, the Sacro Catino was offered to a rich Jew of Metz as pledge for a loan of 100,000 crowns. 
he was loath to take it as he probably recognized its spurious character and when his christian clients forced him to accept it under threats of dire vengeance in case of refusal he protested that they were taking a base advantage of the unpopularity of his faith since they could not find a christian who would make the loan however when some years later the genoese were ready to redeem this precious relic they were much puzzled to learn that a half-dozen different persons claimed to have it in their possession the fact being that the jew had fabricated a number of copies which he had succeeded in pawning for large sums assuring the lender in each case that the redemption of the pledge was certain among the celebrated emeralds noted by george agricola fourteen ninety to fifteen fifty five was a large one preserved in a monastery near lyon france this is also mentioned by gesner who states that it was shaped as a dish or shallow cup and was held to be the holy grail like its rival at genoa another of agricola's emeralds was somewhat smaller but nevertheless measured nine inches in diameter and was in the chapel of st wenceslas at prague this may have been a chrysoprase as at the present day many fine specimens of this stone can be seen in st wenceslas where the walls are inlaid with the golden green gemstone still another larger than the last named was set in the gold monstrance in magdeburg and was believed to have been the handle of emperor otto the first's knife since it was perforated possibly however the emerald if genuine was an oriental stone for it was customary to pierce rubies sapphires emeralds etc in the east so as to string them for necklaces or attach them as pendants to a jewel in the convent church of st stephan in persian armenia erected about the middle of the seventeenth century it is related by the french traveller tavernier that there was preserved a cross said to be made out of the basin in which christ washed the feet of the apostles set in this cross was a white stone and the priests asserted that when the cross was laid upon the body of one seriously ill this stone would turn black if he were about to die but would regain its white hue after his death no jewelled sacred image has been the object of greater reverence than has been accorded to the rude little wooden carving popularly known as the sacro bambino or sacred baby in the old church of aracoeli in rome this figure was carved in eighteen forty seven by a monk out of a piece of olive wood from one of the ancient trees growing on the mount of olives near jerusalem the carving was executed in the holy land and was sent thence to italy and although the ship bearing it was shipwrecked this precious freight was miraculously preserved and is supposed to have been conveyed to its destination in some mysterious way the reverence of the thousands of pilgrims who in the course of time have gazed with veneration upon this quaint and curious work of art has found expression in the bestowal of a wealth of gems and jewels including necklaces brooches rings etc with which the silken dress of the image is studded a crown of gold adorned with precious stones rests upon the head of the olive wood figure which is jealously guarded by the priests and only shown to the faithful as a particular favor except on the occasion of certain religious festivals one of the most renowned emeralds in the world surmounted the elaborately jewelled imperial crown that was placed upon the head of the venerated image of the Virgen del Sagrario in the Cathedral of Toledo. This emerald of a rich green color was cut as a perfect sphere and measured about forty millimeters or one and a half inches in diameter the crown itself was the work of the toledan goldsmith don diego alejo de montoya who began his task in fifteen seventy four 
and devoted twelve years to its completion. It is described as being of almost pure gold and executed in the Renaissance style. Curiously chased in arabesque designs and enameled in various colors, the framework of the crown served as a magnificent background for the gems constituting its adornment, which comprised rubies, emeralds, and oriental pearls. A row of angels and cherubs sustained the arches which bore at their summit the allegorical figures of faith, hope, and charity. Upon that representing faith rested the splendid emerald. This precious ornament was still preserved in the cathedral in 1865, but was so carelessly guarded that it was stolen in 1869. If we are to believe the following anecdote, the emerald disappeared at an earlier date. It is said that in 1809, during the French occupation of Spain, Marshal Junot visited this cathedral, and the emerald was pointed out to him as one of the chief glories of the shrine. As soon as the marshal's covetous glance rested upon the gem, he plucked it from its setting, remarking coolly to the astonished and horrified bystanders, This belongs to me. Then, smiling and bowing, he left the cathedral with the emerald safely ensconced in his waistcoat pocket. Later it was replaced by an imitation in glass. The famous collection of jewels gathered together in the treasury of the Santa Casa at Loreto, Italy, was plundered during the French occupation in 1797, and all trace of most of the magnificent ornaments has been lost. These represented the gifts of many crowned heads and titled personages. Among the former was the unfortunate Henrietta Maria, wife of Charles I, who donated a golden heart-shaped jewel with the words Jesus Maria encrusted in diamonds. This jewel is described as being as big as both a man's hands opened onto two leaves, on one of which was the figure of the Blessed Virgin, and on the other a portrait of the Queen herself. Of the many rich vestments for decorating the statue of the Virgin in the sanctuary, the most splendid was the gift of the Infanta Isabel of Flanders, and was valued at forty thousand crowns. In a seventeenth-century account by an English traveller, it is thus described. It's set thick with six rows of diamonds down before, to the number of three thousand, and it's all wrought over with a kind of embroidery of little pearl, set thick everywhere within the flowers with great round pearl, to the number twenty thousand pearls in all. The same writer tells us the niche in which the statue was placed was bordered with a row of precious stones of great number, size, and value, the colors being so varied that this bordering formed a rich iris of several colors. There is also said to have been a great pearl set in gold and engraved with the image of the Virgin and Child. It seems probable that this was a jewel made of a Baroque pearl or pearls completed by enamel work so as to represent the sacred figures. The pectoral cross worn in solemn processions by the prior of the monastery of San Lorenzo del Escorial was adorned with eight perfect emeralds, five diamonds, and five pearls. From it hung a splendid pear-shaped pearl, the gift of Philip II in 1595, and one of the finest of those acquired by this monarch. In 1740, the cross was valued at 50,000 crowns, Philip's great pearl not being included in this valuation. The monastery of Stronschall, later Whitby Abbey, was founded about 656 A.D. by Oswy, king of Northumbria, in fulfillment of a vow made before his victory over the pagan king Penda at the Battle of Winwidfeld, fought in November 654. 
St. Hilda was made abbess of this monastery, and Oswy's daughter, Elflelda, took the veil, and eventually in 680 succeeded Hilda as abbess. She died in 713. Tradition relates that at this early date, crosses and rosaries were made for the inmates of the monastery from the jet found in the neighborhood. The Whitby jet, so popular and fashionable in the 18th century, was largely derived from the same source, and since then has had several revivals, until replaced by black-stained chalcedony, the so-called onyx, and later still by steel carved with glass and glass itself. In the 16th century, jet was popularly called black amber, and Cardano states that in his time, beads of this material were made up into rosaries. He also says that curious figures made of jet were brought from Spain to Italy. Many are unaware of the fact that a number of ornamental objects made of nephrite and jadeite, unquestionably of European origin, are to be seen in the quiet little town of Perugia. These objects, collected principally in central and southern Italy, constitute the Bellucci collection in that city. This collection also contains other specimens of worked jadeite, which must have been brought to Europe at the time of the Spanish conquest of Mexico and Peru. A very interesting example shows us the utilization of a pagan Celt to form a Christian emblem. By the removal of a rectangular piece from each of the four corners of the jadeite Celt, a perfect cross has been made, the back and front of which still offer the original polish given to the material centuries ago by the Native American worker. The superstitious belief propagated in Europe by the returning Spanish sailors, very probably an invention of their own to enhance the value of their jade and jadeite, that these minerals were worn by the natives as a cure for diseases of the kidneys, whence the name lapis nephriticus, rendered the material exceptionally precious in the eyes of many, and quite possibly it may have been thought that, by transforming this object into the sacred form of the cross, a talisman would be produced that would not only effect the cure of a special disease, but would also by its superior virtue guard the wearer from harm and danger of all kinds. Here may also be seen some Celts of European jade sewed up in little bags to be worn on the loins. End of chapter 7, part 4「The Curious Lore of Precious Stones」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros – The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kunz Chapter 7 – Part 5 Religious Uses of Precious Stones, Pagan, Hebrew, and Christian Certain curious amulets, called magatama, crooked jewels, have been found in Japanese graves of the Iron Age. They are formed of various materials, among others, of steatite, jasper, carnelian, agate, rock crystal, chrysoprase, and nephrite, jade. In the shell heaps of a period preceding the Iron Age, the magatama are frequently made of horn, or of boar's or wolf's teeth, and their peculiar form, which is variously explained as a symbol, may have been conditioned by the shape of the materials originally used. The magatama were evidently regarded as amulets. They are generally perforated at the thick end, and were worn on a string, together with beads and bugles of the same material. These peculiar ornaments were used to adorn the statues of the gods, and were also employed as imperial insignia and distinctive marks of high rank. 
at the present day they are numbered among the three emblems of sovereignty in japan a green and a red magatama are combined in the national emblem of korea and a similar figure is used in china to symbolize the union of the masculine and feminine principles yang and yin in nature dr bells believes that the swastika emblem encountered in so many different parts of the world belongs to the same order of ideas the Bagai tribes of Burma have many superstitions in regard to stones such as garnets, rock crystal, chalcedony, carnelian, agate, onyx, and others of less value, their repute not depending entirely or principally upon their quality as gemstones. In almost every household is installed a stone fetish, and blood offerings are on occasion made to this, a question as to the reason for this offering elicited the following reply if we do not give it blood to eat it will eat us a common belief was that spirits good or bad dwelt in the stones and in case a great misfortune befell a family this was sometimes laid to the charge of such a spirit the father of a family having died his widow commanded her son to throw away their magic stone this he did but the spirit was not to be denied for shortly afterward this very stone was found to have returned to its accustomed place and had even brought two companion stones with it ruy gonzalez de clavijo who travelled in the east during the years fourteen o three to fourteen o six gives a description of a slab of stone bearing the outlines of a natural picture and placed in the church of saint sophia in constantinople in the wall on the left hand side there is a very large white slab on which among many other figures was drawn very naturally without any human artifice of sculpture or painting the most sacred and blessed virgin mary with our lord jesus christ in her most holy arms with his most glorious forerunner saint john the baptist on one side these images as i said before are not drawn or painted with any color or inlaid but the stone itself gave birth to this picture with its veins which may be clearly seen and they say that when this stone was cut to be placed in this most holy place the workmen saw these most wonderful and fortunate images on it and as this church was the most important one in the city that stone was deposited in it the said images appear as if they were in the clouds of heaven and as if there was a thin veil before them many other examples of these natural gems are noted by early writers among them was an agate gem in the treasury of the basilica of st mark in venice upon this gem appeared the head of a king adorned with a diadem the whole design being figured naturally by the veining of the agate and not owing anything to artifice in the same city upon a column in the church of san giorgio maggiore could be seen the likeness of our lord hanging from the cross such stones with peculiar markings indicating the form of human heads and figures were regarded as the work of higher powers another remarkable example is described by kircher as follows in rome in the chapel of the sacred virgin near the organ to the right hand of those who entered the church of st peter an image may be seen in which the blessed virgin of loreto is so artistically depicted by nature that it appears to be the work of an artist's hand she is attired in a triple garment divided by a zone and holds in her arms the child who is distinguished by a crown as is the mother around may be seen the figures of angels the red spots upon the bloodstone were said in christian legend to represent the blood of christ this idea has been beautifully utilized in some gems cut from this stone whereon the thorn crowned head of christ is so placed that the red spots of the bloodstone figure the drops of blood trickling down the hair and face of the saviour such a gem might well be looked upon as a christian amulet and one that could be reverently worn by any believer the ignorance in the middle ages of the art of gem engraving often induced the belief that engraved stones were the work of nature 
a striking instance of this was the celebrated stone over the figure of the mother of jesus on the tomb of saint elizabeth of marburg on this gem appeared two heads touching each other and it was according to tradition not a work of art but a freak of the sculptress nature an oft-repeated legend tells us that a former elector of mintz offered the whole district of Ammonenburg for this costly stone which robber hands removed at cassel it is in reality a fine onyx engraved with heads of castor and pollux we might be disposed to regard rather sceptically the tales regarding wonderful stones bearing the image of christ or that of the virgin mary and we may be inclined to believe that the old accounts are exaggerated or distorted by the pious imaginations of the writers nevertheless in our own time we have a well-attested case of the discovery of such a stone in eighteen eighty while visiting the village of ober amergau bavaria to witness the passion play mrs eugenia jones bacon of atlanta georgia found on mount kopfel which overlooks the village a small stone composed of chert and limestone and having on its surface excrescences so disposed that when the stone was held at a certain angle the shadows cast by them formed a striking likeness of the head of christ as depicted in christian art this peculiar freak specimen has been carefully examined by experts and has been pronounced to be entirely a work of nature the mineralogist is not disposed to see here anything more than coincidence and yet the most sceptical cannot fail to be impressed by the fact that such a stone was found at the time and place of the passion play as max muller said in commenting on this strange discovery the chapter of accidents is much larger than we imagine and the present writer feels disposed to add that it is remarkable how often we find what we are looking for especially if we are only looking or thinking of one object or subject the religious symbolism of the diamond was a favorite theme with the thirteenth century lapidaria or rhymed treatises on precious stones just as it could only be discovered by night an old fancy so was the incarnation a hidden mystery it gave forth a great light just as jesus illumined the depths of hades when he descended thither it was unconquerably hard and who can resist the might of god the medieval italians who were fond of seeking some hidden and significant meaning in the names of precious stones in the case of the diamond diamante read the phrase amante de dio or lover of god this was a reason for regarding the brilliant gem as a sacred stone and one especially suitable for religious use the rosicrucians who sought to combine pagan with christian types and figures saw in the amethyst and the amethystine color a symbol of the divine male sacrifice since the stone and the color were typical of love truth passion suffering and hope the love of christ led him to make the supreme sacrifice and suffer the agony of the cross and the crucifixion was followed by the resurrection whence came the hope of mankind to enjoy eternal happiness in heaven the chiastolite or mackle shows the representation of a cross on its surface this effect being produced by the regular arrangement of carbonaceous impurities along the axes of the crystal the name signifies a marking resembling the greek letter x chi this marking is often very striking in appearance and the crystal was naturally regarded as having a mystical and religious significance it was said to staunch the flow of blood from any part of the body if worn so as to touch the skin and it was also believed to increase the secretion of milk all kinds of fevers were cured by this mineral if it were worn suspended from the neck and the divine symbol it bore served to drive away evil spirits from the neighborhood of the wearer this very interesting mineral occurs very frequently in mica schist when found it appears about the thickness of a small finger tapering slightly at each edge if broken near one end it often shows a white cross with a veined outline of black making a distinct cross with black markings 
the crystals frequently measure from two to four inches in length and are found in massachusetts california and other places if small segments are broken off it will be found that the black outline will become stronger and the white less marked until finally a black cross will appear with white markings the white material is the result of two white wedges pushed point onward until the ends meet the narrow end of one wedge being crossed by the broad end of the second wedge and the black filling in the balance of the square no two of these square crosses can thus ever be exactly alike and when polished the crystals naturally form an interesting stone that was known as lapis crucifer or cross stone by the ancients the peculiar form of the mineral known as storolite from the greek cross is due to the twinning of two crystals at right angles in cronstedt's treatise on mineralogy published in stockholm in seventeen fifty eight we are told that the storolite was sometimes called basilar tofstein baptismal stone or lapis crucifer the former name being used in basil where the stone was employed as an amulet at baptisms however the lapis crucifer of dubut appears from his description to have been the chiastolite in brittany these twin crystals were worn as charms and local legends state that they had dropped from the heavens fine crystals of storolite have been found in patrick county virginia and there is said to be a beautiful local legend in regard to their origin near where they are found there wells up a spring of limpid water and the story goes that one day long long ago when the fairies were dancing and playing around this spring an elfin messenger winged his way through the air and alighted among them he bore to them the sad tidings of the crucifixion of christ in a far-off city so mournful was his recital of the sufferings of the saviour that the fairies burst into tears and these fairy teardrops as they fell to earth crystallized into the form of the cross these natural crosses are in great demand as charms and ex-president roosevelt is said to wear one of them mounted as a watch charm there has been found in the southern part of new mexico and in northern mexico a blue variety of calamine a hydrous silicate of zinc colored blue by an admixture of copper this stone has been cut into gem form and has been sold to a certain extent as a cheap gem it is translucent and is sometimes veined with white wavy lines the mexican indians employed in the mines often set up a cross and a candle near where they were working so that they may pay their devotions at this improvised shrine in sonora and western chihuahua the indians frequently place a piece of the stone to which we have alluded alongside the cross they may be attracted by its beautiful blue color or they may believe that it is a turquoise although it does not resemble this latter stone which is more opaque of a different shade of blue and of a different composition in some epitaphs the hope of the resurrection finds expression in likening the body enclosed in its narrow coffin to a precious jewel in its casket the following lines from a tombstone erected in sixteen fifty five to the memory of mary courtney at foul cornwall england give a good example of this class of inscription near this a rare jewels set closed up in a cabinet let no sacrilegious hand break through tis ye strict command of the jeweller who hath said and tis fit he be obeyed i'll require it safe and sound both above and underground in a churchyard at prittlewell essex england a rather whimsical treatment of the same idea is offered by some verses engraved on the stone marking the graves of two wives of a certain freeborn the first of whom died in sixteen forty one and the second in sixteen fifty eight the bereaved husband seems to have been perfectly willing to await the day of judgment for the return of his lost spouses 
under this stone two precious gems do lie equal in weight worth lustre sanctity yet perhaps one of them do excel which was it who knows ask him who knew them well by long enjoyment if he thus be pressed he'll pause then answer truly both were best were in my choice that either of ye twain might be returned to me to enjoy again which should i choose well since i know not whether i'll mourn for the loss of both but wish for neither yet here's my comfort herein lies my hope the time a coming cabinets shall ope which are locked fast then shall i see my jewels to my joy my jewels me the christian symbolism of colors has in many cases determined the use of certain colored gems for religious ornaments and therefore the following summary of their principal significance is of interest here white is regarded as the first of the canonical colors and as emblematic of purity innocence virginity faith life and light for this reason it is used in the ceremonies of easter and christmas as in those of the circumcision and epiphany of our lord as the color of virginity it is especially appropriate for the festival of the virgin mary and as that of faith not sealed with blood for the festivals of the saints who were not martyred the heavenly host of angels and saints wear white robes and in pictures of the assumption of the virgin she is frequently clad in white red is used at the feasts of the exaltation and invention of the cross at pentecost and at the feast of martyrs it suggests and symbolizes suffering and martyrdom for the faith and the supreme sacrifice of christ upon the cross divine love and majesty are also typified by this color blue is an emblem of the celestial regions and of the celestial virtues nevertheless as this is not one of the five canonical colors it is not employed for the decoration of churches or for ecclesiastical vestments in christian art however the virgin and the saints and angels are often robed in blue yellow of a golden hue is emblematic of god's goodness and of faith and good works but it is not a canonical color a dull yellow however has the opposite signification and is a type of treachery and envy hence judas is garbed in yellow of a dull hue and heretics wore garments of this shade when they were condemned to the stake green is the canonical color for use on sundays weekdays and ordinary festivals hope and joy and the bright promises of youth are signified by green violet another canonical color is appropriate for use on septuagesima and quinquagesima sundays during lent and on advent sunday the chastening and purifying effects of suffering find expression in this color black also a canonical color is a symbol of death and of the mourning and sorrow inspired by death therefore it is only used in the church on good friday to symbolize the sorrow and despair of the christian community at the death of christ a sorrow soon to be turned to joy by his glorious resurrection end of chapter seven part five Chapter 8, Part 1 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz. Chapter 8 On the High Priest's Breastplate, Part 1. Very early and very naturally, the religious nature of man led to the use of precious stones in connection with worship, the most valuable and elegant objects being chosen for sacred purposes. Of this mode of thought, we have a striking instance in the accounts given, in the book of Exodus, of the breastplate of the high priest, and the gems contributed for the tabernacle by the Israelites in the wilderness. Another religious association of such objects is their use to symbolize ideas of the divine glory, as illustrated in the visions of the prophet Ezekiel and in the description of the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. 
Apart from such legitimate uses, however, gems have become associated with all manner of religious fancies and superstitions, traces of which appear in the Talmud, the Quran, and similar writings. They have also been dedicated to various heathen deities. Even in modern times, some trace of the same ideas remain in the ecclesiastical jewelry and its supposed symbolism. In the vision of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 26, and in a brief allusion to the similar appearance of the God of Israel in Exodus chapter 24, the throne of Jehovah, or the pavement beneath his feet, is compared to a sapphire, and the Apostle John, in the Apocalypse, describes the great white throne as surrounded by a rainbow like an emerald. The rabbinical writings, instead of the simple grandeur of these biblical comparisons, give us many fanciful ideas. The stones of the breastplate are here represented as sacred to twelve mighty angels who guard the gates of paradise, and wondrous tales are told of the luminous gems in the tent of Abraham and the Ark of Noah. Mohammedan legend represents the different heavens as composed of different precious stones, and in the Middle Ages, these religious ideas became interwoven with a host of astrological, alchemistic, and medical superstitions. The following is the description of the breastplate given in Exodus chapter 28 verses 15 to 30. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twine linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be, being doubled, a span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof and thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreathen work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings, and shalt put the rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate and the other two ends of the two wreathen chains, thou shalt fasten in the two ouches, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof, unto the rings of the ephod, with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosened from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel, in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart, when he goeth in unto the holy place, for a memorial before the Lord continually." and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart, when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Of the miraculous quality of the stones worn by the high priest, the Jewish historian Josephus, 37 to 95 AD, says, from the stones which the high priest wore, these were sardonyxes, and I hold it superfluous to describe their nature, since it is known to all. There emanated a light, as often as God was present at the sacrifices, that which was worn on the right shoulder, instead of a clasp, emitting a radiance sufficient to give light, even to those far away, although the stone previously lacked this splendor. And certainly this in itself merits the wonder of all those who do not, out of contempt for religion, allow themselves to be led away by a pretense of wisdom. However, I am about to relate something still more wonderful, namely, that God announced victory in battle by means of the twelve stones worn by the high priest on his breast, set in the pectoral, 
for such a splendor shone from them when the army was not yet in motion that all the people knew that god himself was present to their aid for this reason the greeks who reverence our solemnities since they could not deny this call the pectoral logton or oracle however the pectoral and the onyxes cease to emit this radiance two hundred years before the time when i write this because god was displeased at the transgressions of the law this writer who must have seen the high priest wearing his elaborate vestments says that the breastplate was adorned with twelve stones of exceptional size and beauty a decoration not easily to be acquired on account of its enormous value however these gems were not merely rare and costly they also possessed wonderful and miraculous powers writing about four hundred a d saint epiphanius bishop of constantia tells of a marvelous adamas which was worn on the breast of the high priest who showed himself to the people arrayed in all his gorgeous vestments at the feast of pashka pentecost and tabernacles this adamas was termed the delosis or declaration because by its appearance it announced to the people the fate that god had in store for them if the people were sinful and disobedient the stone assumed a dusky hue which portended death by disease or else it became the color of blood signifying that the people would be slain by the sword if however the stone shone like the driven snow then the people recognized that they had not sinned and hastened to celebrate the festival there seems to be little doubt that this account is nothing more than an elaboration and modification of the passage in josephus evidently the logton or oracle of josephus has become the delosis or declaration when moses wished to engrave on the stones of the breastplate the names of the twelve tribes of israel he is said to have had recourse to the miraculous shamir the names are first traced in ink on the stones and the shamir was then passed over them the result being that the traced inscriptions became engraven on the stones in proof of the magical character of this operation no particles of the gems were removed in the process the name really designates emery an argument against the use of especially rare and costly stones in the decoration of the breastplate has been found in its probable size we are told that when folded it measured a span in each direction and this would indicate that its length and breadth were each from eight to nine inches in this case the stones themselves might have measured two by two and a half inches and in view of the number of characters required to express some of the tribal names these dimensions do not seem excessive it is highly improbable that in the time of moses precious stones like the ruby the emerald or the sapphire would have been available in these dimensions the difficulty of engraving very hard stones with the appliances at the command of the hebrews of this period must also be taken into consideration as we shall see however there is good reason to believe that after the babylonian captivity a new breastplate was made and at that time it may have been easier to secure and work precious stones of great value and a high degree of hardness we must also bear in mind that in those periods perfection was not so great a requisite as rich color in his commentary on exodus chapter twenty eight cornelius a lapide cornelius van den steen discusses the question of the diamond in the high priest's breastplate in the first place he notes that the diamond was very costly and that a large stone could have been needed to bear the name of judah or that of any other tribe he considers that a stone of the requisite size would have cost a hundred thousand gold crowns and he asks whence could the poor hebrews have obtained such a sum of money and where could they have found such a diamond he proceeds to give still another reason for doubting that the diamond was in the breastplate namely that it would have marked too great a distinction between the tribes the result being that the tribe to which the diamond was assigned would have been puffed up with pride while the others would have been filled with hatred and envy for the diamond is the queen gem of all the gems the use of the breastplate to reveal the guilt of an offender is testified to in a samaritan version of the book of joshua which has been discovered by dr moses gaster chief rabbi of the spanish and portuguese jews in england according to this version Achan steals a golden image from a heathen temple in jericho the high priest's breastplate reveals his guilt for the stones lose their light and grow dim when his name is pronounced many conjectures have been made as to the origin of the breastplate with the mystic urim and thummim enclosed within it 
that an egyptian origin should be sought seems most probable a breast ornament worn by the high priest of memphis as figured in an egyptian relief consists of twelve small balls or crosses intended to represent egyptian hieroglyphs as it cannot be determined that these figures were cut from precious stones the only definite connection with the hebrew ornament is the number of the figures this suggests but fails to prove a common origin the monuments show that the high priest of memphis wore this ornament as early as the fourth dynasty or approximately four thousand b c of the urim and thummim the mysterious oracle of the ancient hebrews saint augustine three fifty four to four fifty a d after acknowledging the great difficulty of interpreting the meaning of the words and the character of the oracle as that some believe the words to signify a single stone which changed color according as the answer was favorable or unfavorable while the priest was entering the sanctuary still he thought it possible that merely the letters of the words urim and thummim were inscribed upon the breastplate after the capture of jerusalem by titus in seventy a d the treasures of the temple were carried off to rome and we learn from josephus that the breastplate was deposited in the temple of concord which had been erected by vespasian here it is believed to have been at the time of the sacking of rome by the vandals under genseric in four fifty five although rev c w king thinks it is not improbable that alaric king of the visigoths when he sacked rome in four ten a d might have secured this treasure however the express statement of procopius that the vessels of the jews were carried through the streets of constantinople on the occasion of the vandalic triumph of belisarius in five thirty four may be taken as a confirmation of the conjecture that the vandals had secured possession of the breastplate and its jewels it must however be carefully noted that procopius nowhere mentions the breastplate and that it need not have been included among the vessels of the jews it appears that this part of the spoils of belisarius was placed by justinian four eighty three to five sixty five in the sacristy of the church of saint sophia some time later the emperor is said to have heard of the saying of a certain jew to that effect that until the treasures of the temple were restored to jerusalem they would bring misfortune upon any place where they might be kept if this story be true justinian may have felt that the fate of rome was a lesson for him and that constantinople must be saved from a like disaster moved by such considerations he is said to have sent the sacred vessels to jerusalem and they were placed in the church of the holy sepulchre this brings us to the two last events which can be even plausibly connected with the mystic twelve gems namely the capture and sack of jerusalem by the sassanian persian king khusrau the second in six fifteen and the overthrow of the sassanian empire by the mohammedan arabs and the capture and sack of Ctesiphon in six thirty seven if we admit that khusrau took the sacred relics of the temple with him to persia we may be reasonably sure that they were included among the spoils secured by the arab conquerors although king who has ingenuously endeavored to trace out the history of the breastplate jewels after the fall of jerusalem in seventy a d believes that they may be still buried in some unknown treasure chamber of one of the old persian capitals a fact which has generally been overlooked by those who have embarked on the sea of conjecture relative to the fate of the breastplate stones is that a large jewish contingent numbering about twenty six thousand men form part of the force with which the sansanian persians captured jerusalem and they might well lay claim to any jewish vessels or jewels that may have been secured by the conquerors in this case however it is still probable that these precious objects fell into the hands of the mohammedans who captured jerusalem in the same year in which they took Ctesiphon. one circumstance which may have contributed to the preservation of these stones in their original form after they fell into the hands of the romans is the fact that each one was engraved with the name of one of the jewish tribes the inscription being probably in the older form of hebrew writing which was used in the coinage even as late as the last revolt in one thirty seven a d hence recutting would have been necessary to fit them for use as ornaments a process not easily accomplished and involving a great loss of size 
we must also bear in mind that the intrinsic value of the gems may not have been so great as many suppose since all of them were probably of the less perfect forms of the precious and semi-precious varieties it is very likely that the enthusiastic statements of josephus in this connection were dictated by national pride or arose from the tendency to exaggerate so common among the oriental writers certainly if the breastplate known to josephus was made not long after the return of the jews from the babylonian captivity their financial resources at the time of its fabrication were quite restricted admitting as a possibility that the arabs may have secured possession of the breastplate how would they have regarded it the heroes of the old testament and especially moses were such sacred personalities in the eyes of the mohammedans that this relic would have been as precious for them as for us however the victorious arabs who overran the sassanian empire although filled with religious zeal were no students of archaeology and would have been quite unable to decipher the strange characters engraved on the stones they would most probably have supposed them to be persian characters and would therefore have valued these stones no higher than others in the persian treasure this can serve as an explanation of the fact that no allusion to the breastplate with its ornament can be found in the works of those mohammedan writers such as tabari who treat of the overthrow of the sassanian empire we may be sure that the persians themselves would have accorded no special honor to objects connected with the hebrew religion since their own zoroastrian faith had no connection with it End of chapter 8, part 1. Chapter 8, part 2 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz. Chapter 8 on the high priest breastplate part two in six twenty eight not long before the date of the arab invasion the most precious relic of christendom the cross discovered by helena mother of constantine the great and believed to be the very cross on which christ died was surrendered to the greek emperor heraclius by kobad the second son of kusrau the second on the conclusion of a treaty of peace between the eastern and Sassanian empires this cross was one of the sacred objects borne away to Persia from Jerusalem by Kusrau in 615 AD. It is said to have been guarded carefully through the influence of Sira, Kusrau's Christian wife. There is a bare possibility that other objects of religious veneration taken from Jerusalem may have been given up by the Persians at the same time, and that the unique character of the most important relic so overshadowed all others that historians have failed to note the fact the cross was restored to jerusalem by heraclius in six twenty nine only to fall into the hands of the mohammedans when that city was taken by the arabs under omar in six thirty seven hence if the jeweled breastplate had also been surrendered by kobad it would probably have shared the same fate we have here a wide field for conjecture but unfortunately nothing more still in the absence of any definite and trustworthy information there is a kind of romantic interest in viewing the various possible relations of the mystery surrounding the fate of the most precious gems historically at least that have ever existed more especially is this interest justified in the case of all who are disposed to prize gems and jewels for their symbolic significance for as we have shown this significance as far as concerns natal stones and the spiritual interpretation of the qualities of the heart and soul symbolized by the color and character of the principal precious and semi-precious stones has its root in the veneration felt by early christian writers beginning with the author of the apocalypse for the unforgotten and unforgettable gems that were worn by the hebrew high priest a rather ingenious utilization of the reputed powers of aaron's breastplate comes to us in a book printed in Portland, Maine. The writer assumes that the Urim and Thummim, enclosed in the folds of the breastplate, consisted of twelve stones, duplicates of those engraved with the names of the tribes, and so disposed that, when they were shaken to and fro, and then allowed to come to rest, three of them would become visible through an aperture in the ephod, just beneath the rows of set stones, 
the signification of the oracle is given by the various combinations of color offered by the three stones that reveal themselves to each combination a pre-arranged meaning is given that anything of the kind could have been true of the original urim and thummim is scarcely worth the trouble of refutation but the practical result of this modern experiment is a clever oracle which will probably enjoy a certain vogue for those who with the late lamented lieutenant totten see in the tribes of manasseh and ephraim the anglo-saxons of england and the united states and who look upon george v as the king who sits upon the throne of david these symbolic stones of the breastplate acquire an added significance while not pretending to be able to follow all the intricate and certainly most ingenious and interesting speculations of this school of biblical exegesis we cannot help expressing some astonishment that ephraim should be thought to prefigure england and manasseh the united states instead of vice versa in genesis chapter forty eight verses seventeen to twenty the text more especially referred to in these speculations jacob's blessing is bestowed upon ephraim in spite of joseph's protest that it should go to the eldest son manasseh to this protest jacob answers i know it my son i know it he also that is manasseh shall become a people and he also shall be great but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he and his seed shall become a multitude of nations certainly the very composite population of the united states perfectly merits this description as a general rule the hebrews when using the names ephraim and manasseh as tribal designations maintain the twelvefold division of the people by substituting these tribes for joseph and by dropping the name of levi from the list the tribe of levi being assigned as priests to the care of the sanctuary and not participating in the division of the land of promise in the midrash bemadar the rabbinical commentary on numbers the tribes are given in their order with the stone appropriate to each and the color of the tribal standard pitched in the desert camp this color corresponding in each case with that of the tribal stone this list represents a tradition dating back to at least the twelfth century and possibly much earlier than that hence its value should not be underestimated although we may not accept it without some reserves odom reuben red piddah simeon green bereketh levi white black and red jophek judah sky blue sapir issachar black with stibium yahalam zebulun white leshem dan sapphire color shebo gad gray alamal naphtali wine color tarshish asher pearl color shoham joseph very black lashfe benjamin colors of all the stones in the attempt to determine the identity of the stones enumerated in exodus chapters twenty eight and thirty nine as adorning the breastplate of the high priest we must bear in mind that this breastplate of aaron and the one described by josephus and brought by titus to rome after the capture of jerusalem in seventy a d are in all probability entirely distinct objects the former if it ever existed except in the ideal world of the authors of the priestly codex must have been composed of the stones known to and used by the egyptians of the thirteenth and fourteenth century b c some of them being perhaps set in the jewels of gold and jewels of silver borrowed by the israelites from the egyptians just before the exodus on the other hand the most trustworthy indications regarding the stones of the breastplate of the second temple made perhaps in the fifth century b c should be sought in the early greek and latin versions of the old testament and in the treatise on the precious stones by theophrastus who wrote about three hundred b c the natural history of pliny that great storehouse of ancient knowledge and the other early writers may also be used with profit one odom the etymology of this word clearly indicates that we have to do with a red stone most probably the carnelian we know that in ancient egypt hieroglyphic texts from the book of the dead were engraved upon amulets made from this stone and it was also used for early babylonian cylinders fine specimens of carnelian were obtained from arabia 
the greek septuagint and the latin vulgate as well as josephus in the wars of the jews volumes five and seven and epiphanius all translate sardius the ancient designation of the carnelian in his antiquities however josephus renders odum by sardonyx the egyptian word canem was used to designate red stones and seems to have been applied indifferently to red jasper and red feldspar as well as to the carnelian indeed the first named material was more freely used in early egyptian work than the carnelian it is therefore probable that in mosaic times odum signified red jasper while for the fifth century b c carnelian would be the better rendering this modern name of the sardius signifying the flesh-colored stone first appears in the latin translation of a treatise by luca ben costa who wrote in the tenth century a d the name of reuben is said to have been engraved on the odum stone which occupied the first place on the breastplate two pida there seems to be little doubt that this is the topazius of ancient writers which usually signified our chrysolite or peridot not our topaz for pliny and his successors described the topazius as a stone of greenish hue a legend related by pliny gives as the place of origin an island in the red sea called topazos from topazian to conjecture because it was difficult to find however the hebrew pitta appears to have been derived from the sanskrit pitta yellow and should therefore have originally signified a yellow stone perhaps our topaz w m flinders petri probably influenced by this sanskrit etymology sees in it the yellow serpentine used in ancient egypt if nevertheless we admit that a light green stone occupied the second place on the mosaic breastplate it was perhaps the light green serpentine this was called me in egyptian and was often used for amulets in the case of the later breastplate we may substitute the peridot on this second stone was engraved the name Simeon. 3. Bareketh. Here the Septuagint, Josephus, and the Vulgate agree in translating Smaragdus, and as we know that emerald mines were worked in Mount Zabara in Nubia before the beginning of our era, and that the emerald was known and used in Egypt, there does not seem to be any reason for rejecting the usual translation emerald. Still it must be admitted that Smaragus often designates other green stones than the emerald. The suggestion has been made by Myers and Petri that the passage in Revelation chapter 4 verse 3, where the rainbow is likened to the Smaragdus, indicates that the writer used this name for rock crystal. But this conjecture is scarcely satisfactory, since it confuses the prismatic effects of light which has transversed the crystal with the crystal itself there can be little doubt that a stone of brilliant coloration like the emerald not a colorless one like rock crystal would be used as a simile for the rainbow whether the mosaic breastplate already contained the emerald is another question and it seems rather more likely that green feldspar freely used in ancient egypt for amulets and known as uat was the third stone of the proto breastplate the authorized version makes the carbuncle the third instead of the fourth stone upon the bereketh was engraved the name levi four nofek this name is rendered anthres by the septuagint and josephus and carbunculus by the vulgate this designation signifying literally a glowing coal was used for certain stones distinguished by their peculiarly brilliant red color such as the ruby and certain fine garnets while it is quite possible that the oriental ruby may have been in the breastplate seen by josephus it is almost certain that it could not have been in the original breastplate of mosaic times since there is absolutely no proof that this stone was known in ancient egypt hence we are inclined to believe that in the thirteenth century b c the name nofek designated the almondine garnet or some similar variety of that stone the authorized version has emerald here instead of in the third place on this fourth stone of the breastplate was engraved the tribal name of judah five sapir 
This is rendered sapphirus in all the old versions. The stone cannot have been our sapphire, for both Theophrastus and Pliny describe the sapphirus as a stone with golden spots, thus showing that they meant the lapis lazuli, which is often spotted with particles of pyrite having a golden sheen. This stone was named Chesbet by the Egyptians and was highly prized by them, a quantity of lapis lazuli often appearing as an important item in the lists of tribute paid to Egypt and among the gifts sent by Babylonia to the Egyptian monarchs and obtained from the oldest mines in the world. These were worked at a period 4000 BC and still are worked to this day. From this material, amulets and figures were made, many of which have been preserved for us, and the Egyptian high priest is said to have worn, suspended from his neck, an image of Mat, the goddess of truth, made of lapis lazuli. The name is composed of the Latin lapis, a stone, and Luyuard, the name of the stone in Persian. From this latter word is also derived our azure. In ancient times, the lapis lazuli was the blue stone par excellence, because of its beautiful color and the valuable ultramarine dye derived from it. Although Pliny writes, chapter 37, verse 39, that this stone was too soft for engraving, this fact need not have prevented its use in the breastplate, since the stones set therein were not intended for use as seals, and hence were not subjected to any wear. In this connection, however, it is somewhat strange that the Hebrew word sapir appears to indicate a stone especially adapted to receive inscriptions. The fact that the lapis lazuli was greatly esteemed in ancient Egypt and was still much used as an ornamental stone in Greek and Roman times renders it possible that it was set not only in the original breastplate, but also in that of a later age. Upon this fifth stone, the name Issachar was inscribed. 6. Yaholam the sixth stone of the Septuagint version and of Josephus is the yaspis, probably green jasper or jade, and this has been assumed to show that in the original Hebrew text, Yashve was the sixth stone, in place of Yaholam. The twelfth stone of the Greek version is the onyxion or onyx, and this seems to be the most probable equivalent of the Hebrew Yaholam. Some Hebrew sources, however, render it diamond. And Luther, in his German version of the Bible, as well as our authorized version, translates it thus. This rendering is based upon the derivation of the word Yaholam, from a verb meaning to smite, thus making the name of the stone signify the smiter, a designation not inappropriate for the diamond, which, because of its extreme hardness, has the power to cut or smite all other stones. However, for this purpose, the emery corundum or Simra's point Shamir, mentioned in Zechariah, was most likely used. The diamond was certainly not used in this way in very early times, although it is possible that the stone was employed in engraving in the 5th century BC. These considerations induce us to prefer the traditional interpretation of Yaholam and translate it onyx. In this case, the smiter could be explained as denoting the use of the engraved onyx for sealing, as the engraved figure or letters were struck upon some soft material to make an impression. Zebulun was the tribal name inscribed on the Yaholam. 7. Leshem No stone in the breastplate is more difficult to determine than this one. The Septuagint, Josephus, and the Vulgate all translate Ligurius, an appellation sometimes applied to amber, a substance quite unfitted for use in the breastplate among the other engraved stones. Probably the original significance of Ligurius was amber, this name being used because Liguria, in northern Italy, was the chief source of supply for Greece and the Orient. Amber which had been gathered on the shores of the Baltic, being brought by traders to Liguria and forwarded thence to other lands. As, however, the Greeks had another name for amber, electron, the name Ligurion appears to have been applied later to a variety of the jacinth, somewhat resembling amber in color, and then to other varieties of the same stone. The original form of the name was evidently Ligurion, which was later changed to Lycurion, and then was explained as meaning the urine of the lynx, from lux and uporon, urine. This fanciful etymology gave rise to the story that the Ligurios, or rather Lycurius, was the solidified urine of the lynx. The term Lycurion as used by Theophrastus, 
may possibly have included the sapphire as well as the jacinth since he lays a special stress upon the coldness of this substance a quality characteristic of the sapphire and also of the still denser jacinth hence it appears that we have even in the name ligurius some justification for accepting the rendering hyacinthus suggested by the list of foundation stones in revelation chapter twenty one verse twenty and already proposed by epiphanius bishop of constantia about four hundred a d whether hyacinthus should be rendered sapphire or jacinth is not easy to determine as this name seems to have been used indifferently for both stones with the arabs under the form yakut it became a generic term for all the varieties of the corundum gems the sapphire was engraved in greek and roman times and is perhaps the leshen stone of the second temple for the mosaic breastplate we are forced to seek for some stone known in ancient egypt where the sapphire does not seem to have been introduced at an early date if we could accept the suggestion of burkst that the egyptian leshem stone reputed to have wonderful magic virtues was the same as the hebrew leshem a brown agate would have been the seventh stone in the original breastplate as wendell gives very strong reasons for rendering neshem in this way the color designations were very freely used in egyptian and therefore a reddish or a yellowish brown agate may have been used the leshem bore the tribal name joseph end of chapter eight part two Chapter 8, Part 3 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz. Chapter 8, On the High Priest's Breastplate, Part 3. 8. Shebo. This is uniformly rendered in the ancient versions and in Josephus by Agate, a composite stone highly esteemed in very ancient times and hence worthy of a place among the stones of the breastplate at a later period as pliny notes chapter thirty seven verse fifty four it became so common that it was but little regarded nevertheless the fact that the various kinds of agates were believed to have many talismaic and therapeutic virtues the great variety of coloration observable in these stones and the curious figures and markings displayed by many of them served to make them favorite objects the etymology of the word shebo suggests that it designated more especially a banded agate and that set in the proto breastplate was most probably one with gray and white bands as this variety often appears in egyptian work there would have been no lack of contrast between this stone and the reddish or yellowish brown agate of uniform color which may have occupied the seventh place for the later breastplate we may choose any one of the many kinds of banded agate this stone had engraved upon it the name benjamin nine al malal as to this stone also the authorities are in agreement and render al malal as amethyst this was not however the oriental amethyst a variety of corundum but a dark blue or purple variety of quartz both arabia and syria furnished a supply of amethyst the hebrew name shows that this stone was believed to possess the virtue of inducing dreams and visions cross-reference halam or dream while as is well known the greek name characterizes it as an enemy or preventative of inebriety the amethyst was known in ancient egypt and was probably named hemog in the book of the dead a heart made of hemog is mentioned and two such heart-shaped amulets of amethyst are preserved in the bolak museum as the amethyst retained its repute as a stone of beauty and power through the greek and roman periods we may safely assert that it was set in both the first and second breastplates upon the alama was engraved the name dan ten tarshish the septuagint renders this word chrysolite where it is used in the description of the breastplate as does josephus also in the authorized version beryl is the rendering we have already stated that the topaz of the ancients was usually our chrysolite or peridot and the name chrysolite appears to have been used to designate our topaz this is indeed indicated by the literal meaning of the word golden stone the tarshish received its name from tartesis in spain 
an important commercial station to the Phoenicians. The stone derived from this source was not, of course, our oriental topaz, a variety of corundum, nor was it the true topaz. Neither is it at all likely that the name Tarshish signified, at least originally, the genuine topaz. Most probably it denoted a variety of quartz, which occurred in Spain. This is originally black, but is decolorized by heating to a deep brown, and if the heating be prolonged, the stone becomes paler and eventually entirely transparent. The ancients were familiar with this property. In ancient Egyptian records, a stone called thalen is frequently mentioned as a material from which amulets were made. This Egyptian name signified primarily a yellow stone, and might designate either the topaz or the yellow jasper, known and used in Egypt at a very early date. The topaz was probably not known there earlier than 500 or 600 BC. Hence, in spite of the unquestionable difficulty offered by the geographical name Tarshish, which might seem to confine us to a Spanish origin for the stone, the probabilities favor the selection of the yellow jasper as the tenth gem in Aaron's breastplate, for that made with pious zeal by those who labored to renew the glories of the old Jerusalem, we choose the topaz. Possibly, indeed, a fine specimen of the genuine topaz, for whatever the quality of the yellow stone, originally brought from Tartessus, the name may well have been applied to the genuine topaz when this stone became known to the Jews, either in Babylonia or after their return to Palestine. The Tarshish is engraved with the name Naphtali. 11. Shoham. The Septuagint translates beryl, but in our authorized version, and in that used by Roman Catholics, the so-called Dewey version, the word is invariably rendered onyx. Diodorus Siculus and Dionysius Periagetes, writing in the first century BC, are the first classic authors who use the name beryl. While this name does not appear in the treatise of Theophrastus, he evidently includes the beryl among his smaragdi. Indeed, the true emerald is simply a variety of the beryl and owes its beautiful coloration to a slight admixture of chromium. The finest barrels were brought from India. Besides the specimen set in the breastplate, the high priest wore on his shoulders two shoham stones, each engraved with the names of six of the tribes. After carefully weighing the evidence, we believe that the stones worn by the high priest of the second temple were aquamarines, or barrels. In our endeavor to determine the shoham stones used in Mosaic times, we have no very definite information to guide us. On the whole, the conjecture of J. L. Myers that they were Malachites seems to have much in its favor, for this material was known to the ancient Egyptians and appears to have been often used for amulets. The Egyptian name for Malachite, as well as other green stones, was Mephek, and a ring of Mephek is mentioned in an Egyptian text. Undoubtedly, at a later period in Egyptian history, Mephek may also have denoted the beryl. In view of the fact that the turquoise was unquestionably known to the Egyptians at a very early date, the supply being derived from mines in the Sinai Peninsula, which were rediscovered by MacDonald, we might be tempted to suggest that the Shoham stones were turquoises. The light blue or blue-green of the specimens of this stone found on Mount Sinai would make an even better contrast with the neighboring jade than would the bright green malachite. On the shoham of the breastplate, the name Gad was engraved. 12. Yashva. If, as appears almost certain, this name originally occupied the sixth place in the original Hebrew text, all the ancient versions agree in translating it Jasper. An Assyrian form of the name was Yashpu, as is shown by the Tel El Amarna letters in the cuneiform writing dating from not long before the Exodus. Of all the so-called jaspers, none were so highly valued as those of a green color. The talismaic and therapeutic qualities of the green jaspers are often noted by ancient writers, and according to Gallen, these stones were recommended for remedial use by Egyptian writers on medicine. Abel Ramusat, the great French Orientalist, writing in 1820, was one of the first to see in the yashva of the Hebrews and in the green jasper of the Greeks and Romans, the material jade, nephrite or jadeite, the Chinese used stone. 
These materials were used both in the old and the new world, and were everywhere believed to possess wonderful virtues. Very likely, the powers supposed to characterize jade were later attributed to green jasper, but there is every reason to suppose that the true jade was always more highly prized than its jasper substitute, for it was much rarer and was easily distinguishable by its translucency from jasper of a similar color. Until quite recently, only Turkestan, Burma, and New Zealand have supplied jade, and most of that used in other lands came from prehistoric relics or from sources unknown to us. It seems highly probable that the yashfa, which adorned the breastplate made for Aaron, was a piece of nephrite or jadeite. Possibly in the later breastplate, green jasper may have been employed. This stone was inscribed with the tribal name Asher. In the following lists of the precious and semi-precious stones contained in the earlier and later breastplates, the writer does not claim to have finally solved the problem presented by the Hebrew accounts of the high priest's adornment, but he hopes that the distinction established here between the mosaic breastplate and that of the second temple, separated from each other by an interval of eight centuries, may serve to clear up some of the difficulties encountered in the treatment of this subject. Breastplate of Aaron 1. Red Jasper 2. Light Green Serpentine 3. Green Feldspar 4. Adamantine Garnet 5. Lapis Lazuli 6. Onyx 7. Brown Agate 8. Banded Agate 9. Amethyst 10. Yellow Jasper 11. Malachite 12. Green Jasper or Jade Breastplate of the Second Temple 1. Carnelian 2. Peridot, 3. Emerald, 4. Ruby, 5. Lapis Lazuli, 6. Onyx, 7. Sapphire or Jacinth, 8. Banded Agate, 9. Amethyst, 10. Topaz, 11. Beryl, 12. Green Jasper or Jade. The following lists show the variations of the different ancient writers in regard to the names of the gems in the breastplate. Hebrew, 1. Odom, 2. Pitta, 3. Bareketh, 4. Nofek, 5. Sapir, 6. Yaholam, 7. Leshem, 8. Shebo, 9. Ahalama, 10. Tarshish, 11. Shoham, 12. Yeshva. Septuagint, Josephus, Greek, about 250 BC. 1. Sardian, 2. Topazion, 3. Smaragdos, 4. Anthrax, 5. Sapirios, 6. Yaspis, 7. Ligurion, 8. Achates, 9. Amethystos, 10. Chrysolithos, 11. Beryllion, 12. Onikion. Vulgate, Greek, about 90 AD. 1. Sardonyx, 2. Topazos, 3. Smaragdos, 4. Anthrax, 5. Yaspis, 6. Sapirios, 7. Liguros, 8. Amethystos, 9. Achates, 10. Chrysolithos, 11. Onyx, 12. Barilos. Authorized, Latin, about 400 AD. 1. Sardius, 2. Topazius, 3. Smaragdus, 4. Carbunculus, 5. Sapirius, 6. Jaspis, 7. Ligurius, 8. Achates, 9. Amethystus, 10. Chrysolithus, 11. Onicius, 12. Beryllus. Revised version, 1611 AD. 1. Sardius, 2. Topaz, 3. Carbuncle, 4. Emerald, 5. Sapphire, 6. Diamond, 7. Ligure, 8. Agate, 9. Amethyst, 10. Beryl, 11. Onyx, 12. Jasper. Revised version, 1884 AD. 1. Sardius or Ruby, 2. Topaz, 3. Carbuncle or Emerald, 4. Emerald or Carbuncle, 5. Sapphire, 6. Diamond or Sardonyx, 7. Jacinth or Amber, 8. Agate, 9. Amethyst, 10. Beryl or Chalcedony, 11. Onyx or Beryl, 12. Jasper. 
the high priest's breastplate as described in hebrew tradition was regarded by the jews with peculiar reverence and the stones set in it were believed to be emblematic of many things it is therefore quite natural that these stones are described in the book of revelation as the foundation stones of the new jerusalem the names are in some cases not identical with those in exodus but this may arise from various renderings of the hebrew names in the targums or in the greek versions the text in revelation chapter twenty one verses nine to twenty one is as follows and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying come hither i will show thee the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from god having the glory of god and her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone clear as crystal and had a wall great and high and had twelve gates and at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of israel on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had twelve foundations and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the lamb and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand furlongs the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal and he measured the wall thereof one hundred and forty four cubits according to a measure of a man that is of the angel and the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones the first foundation was jasper the second sapphire the third chalcedony the fourth an emerald the fifth sardonyx the sixth sardius the seventh chrysolite the eighth beryl the ninth a topaz the tenth a chrysoprase the eleventh a jacinth the twelfth an amethyst and the twelve gates were twelve pearls every several gate was one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass it is easy to trace in this description the substitution of the twelve apostles for the twelve tribes in connection with the precious stones enumerated and besides this we also have the twelve angels associated at a later date with the months and the signs of the zodiac of the twelve foundation stones the revelation of st john expressly states that they had in them the names of the twelve apostles of the lamb the assignment of each stone to the respective apostle was made in later times according to the order given in the lists of the apostles contained in the so-called synoptic gospels matthew mark and luke these lists are not quite identical andrew for instance being placed second in matthew and luke but fourth in mark and the same stone was not always assigned to the given apostle frequently the list was modified by the addition of the apostle paul really the thirteenth apostle in this case he was usually given the second place immediately after st peter and to the brothers james and john the sons of thunder was assigned a single stone in some later arrangements st paul occupies the last place after st matthias who was chosen to take the place of judas iscariot and whose name as an apostle first appears in acts lists of the apostles gospel of st matthew chapter ten verses two through four peter andrew james john philip bartholomew thomas matthew james the less thaddeus simon zelotes judas iscariot gospel of st mark chapter three verses sixteen to nineteen peter james john andrew philip bartholomew matthew thomas james the less thaddeus simon zelotes judas iscariot gospel of st luke chapter six verses fourteen to sixteen peter andrew james john philip bartholomew matthew thomas james the less simon zelotes judas judas iscariot 
the passage in revelation chapter twenty one verses nineteen and twenty is not the only one in that book treating of precious stones for we read in chapter four verses two and three and immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald the commentators both ancient and modern have given many different explanations of the symbolic meaning of the similes employed here some have seen in the two stones a type of the two judgments of the world by fire and by water others find that they signify the holiness of god and his justice of the rainbow like unto an emerald alfred says we should not think it strange that the bow is green instead of prismatic the form is that of the covenant bow the color even more refreshing and more directly symbolizing grace and mercy the significance of the twelve apocalyptic gems is given by rabanus maris the bishop of Mance, seven eighty six to eight fifty six in the following words in the jasper is figured the truth of faith in sapphire the height of celestial hope in the chalcedony the flame of inner charity in the emerald is expressed the strength of faith in adversity in the sardonyx the humility of the saints in spite of their virtues in the sard the venerable blood of the martyrs in the chrysolite indeed is shown true spiritual preaching accompanied by miracles in the beryl the perfect operation of prophecy in the topaz the ardent contemplation of the prophecies lastly in the chrysoprase is demonstrated the work of the blessed martyrs and their reward in the hyacinth the celestial rapture of the learned in their high thoughts and their humble descent to human things out of regard for the weak in the amethyst the constant thought of the heavenly kingdom in humble souls the origin of the foundation stones named in revelation chapter twenty one verses nineteen and twenty may be found in the text isaiah chapter fifty four verses eleven and twelve where we read o thou afflicted tossed with tempest and not comforted behold i will lay thy stones with fair colours and lay thy foundations with sapphires and i will make thy windows of agates and thy agates of carbuncles and thy borders of pleasant stones as we see only three stones are mentioned by name the sapphire the carbuncle and agates this last rendering is quite doubtful as the hebrew word kod kadim signifies shining or gleaming stones and their use for windows indicates they must have been transparent it is easy to understand that in later times the twelve stones of the breastplate dedicated to the twelve tribes of israel is used to fill out and complete the picture following the indication given by the general terms stones with fair colors and pleasant stones in commenting on this text rabbi johanan is quoted in the babylonian talmud as saying that god would bring jewels and pearls thirty l square twenty l's in height and ten in width and would place them on the gates of jerusalem there may be in this some reminiscence of the apocalyptic foundation stones a skeptical disciple said to the rabbi we do not ever find a jewel as large as the egg of a dove but not long afterward when this same disciple was sailing in a boat on the sea he saw angels sawing stones as immense as those described by rabbi johanan and when he asked for what they were designed the reply was the holy one blessed be he will place them on the gates of jerusalem end of chapter eight part three chapter nine part one of the curious lore of precious stones this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the curious lore of precious stones by george frederick Kuntz. chapter nine birth stones part one the origin of the belief that to each month of the year a special stone was dedicated and that the stone of the month was endowed with a peculiar virtue for those born in that month and was their natal stone may be traced back to the writings of josephus in the first century of our era and to those of st jerome in the early part of the fifth century 
Both these authors distinctly proclaim the connection between the twelve stones of the high priest's breastplate and the twelve months of the year, as well as the twelve zodiacal signs. Strange to say, however, in spite of this early testimony, we have no instance of the usage of wearing such stones as natal stones until a comparatively late date. Indeed, it appears that this custom originated in Poland some time during the 18th century. The reason for this seems to have been that the virtues attributed to each particular stone, more especially the therapeutic virtues, rendered it necessary to recommend the wearing of one or the other, according to the disease from which the person was suffering, for his natal stone might not have the power to cure his particular ailment, or might not bring about the fulfillment of his dearest wish. In other words, the belief in the special virtues of the stone was paramount, and it was long before the mystic bond between the stone of the month and the person born in that month was fully realized. The order in which the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem are given in the Book of Revelation determined the succession of natal stones for the months. The first stone was assigned to St. Peter and to the month of March, to the leader of the apostles and to the month of the spring equinox, the second to the month of April, the third to May, etc. When, however, many centuries later, probably in Poland, as we have stated, with the aid of the rabbis or the Hebrew gem traders, the wearing of natal stones became usual. Certain changes had been made in this order, and some stones not mentioned, among those of the breastplate, or of the New Jerusalem, were substituted for certain of these, notably the turquoise for the month of December, the ruby for July, and the diamond for April. In modern times, the turquoise has become the stone for July, while the ruby has been assigned to December. There is some evidence in favor of the theory that at the outset, all twelve stones were acquired by the same person and worn in turn, each one during the respective month to which it was assigned, or during the ascendancy of its zodiacal sign. The stone of the month was believed to exercise its therapeutic or talismanic virtue to the fullest extent at that period. Perhaps the fact that this entailed a monthly change of ornaments may rather have been a recommendation of the usage than the reverse. It seems highly probable that the development of the belief in natal stones that took place in Poland was due to the influence of the Jews who settled in that country shortly before we have historic notice of the use of the twelve stones for those born in the respective months. The lively interest always felt by the Jews regarding the gems of the breastplate, the many and various commentaries their learned men have written upon this subject, and the fact that the well-to-do among the chosen people have always carried with them in their wanderings many precious stones, all this seems to make it likely that to the Jews should be attributed the fashion of wearing natal stones. However, whether this conjecture be correct or erroneous, the fashion once started became soon quite general, and has as many votaries today as ever before. There can be no doubt that the owner of a ring or ornament set with a natal stone is impressed with the idea of possessing something more intimately associated with his or her personality than any other stone, however beautiful or costly it may be. If it be objected that this is nothing but imagination due to sentiment, we must bear in mind that the imagination is one of the most potent factors in our life. Indeed, the great Napoleon is quoted as saying that it ruled the world. Probably the very earliest text we have in which the stones of the breastplate are positively associated with the months of the year is to be found in the Antiquities of the Jews by Flavius Josephus. This runs as follows. Moreover, the vestments of the high priest, being made of linen, signifies the earth. The blue denotes the sky, being like lightning in its pomegranates, and resembling thunder in the noise of the bells. And as for the ephod, it showed that God had made the universe of four elements, and as for the gold interwoven in it, I suppose it related to the splendor by which all things are to be enlightened. He also appointed the breastplate to be placed in the middle of the ephod to resemble the earth, for that occupies the middle place in the world, and the girdle, which encompassed the high priest about, signifies the ocean, for that goes about everything. And the two sardonyxes that were in the clasps on the high priest's shoulders indicate to us the sun and the moon. 
and for the twelve stones whether we understand by them the months or the twelve signs of which the greeks call the zodiac we shall not be mistaken in their meaning and for the cap which was of a blue color it seems to me to mean heaven for otherwise the name of god would not have been inscribed upon it that it was also adorned with a crown and that of gold also is because of the splendor with which god is pleased this passage was adapted by saint jerome three hundred years later in his letter to fabiola and undoubtedly laid the foundation for the later custom of wearing one of these stones as a natal or birth stone for a person born in a given month or for an astral or zodiacal stone for one born under a given zodiacal sign as we see both uses are indicated by the passage of josephus in the later centuries as the book of revelation which was generally less favored at the outset than the other parts of the new testament became a subject of devout study and a mine of mystical suggestions the twelve foundation stones revelation twenty one verse nineteen of the new jerusalem largely took the place of the stones of the breastplate while this list of foundation stones is unquestionably based upon the much earlier list of the stones adorning aaron's breastplate the ordering differs considerably and there are some changes in the material possibly many if not all of these differences may be due to textual errors or to a transcription from memory that the foundation stones were inscribed with the names of the apostles is expressly stated revelation twenty one verse fourteen but it was not until the eighth or ninth century that the commentators on revelation busying themselves with finding analogies between these stones and the apostles at the outset the symbolism of the stones was looked upon from a purely religious standpoint few of the early fathers we may accept epiphanius thought or cared much for the stones themselves or knew much of them but in time their natural beauty became more and more highly developed as the lapidarian art demanded better cut and choicer material their supposed virtues came to the fore and the symbolism was strengthened and emphasized by a reference to their innate qualities and also to their peculiar powers the fact that this part of the tradition was rather of pagan than of christian origin probably contributed to render it less attractive to the early christians so that it was not until christianity had become practically universal in the greek and roman world and the opposition to pagan traditions as such was weakened and indeed largely forgotten that the virtues of the stones were made prominent and certain parts of these superstitions were retained as were some of the pagan ceremonies in the christian religion one of the earliest writers to associate directly with the apostles the symbolism of the gems given as foundation stones of the new jerusalem by saint john in revelation twenty one verse nineteen is andreas bishop of caesarea this author was at one time assigned by critics to the fifth century a d but more recent investigation has shown that he probably belonged to the last half of the tenth century his exposition reads as follows jasper which like the emerald is of a greenish hue probably signifies saint peter chief of the apostles as one who so bore christ's death in his inmost nature that his love for him was always vigorous and fresh by his fervent faith he has become our shepherd and leader as the sapphire is likened to the heavens from this stone is made a color popularly called lazure i conceive it to mean saint paul since he was caught up to the third heaven where his soul was firmly fixed thither he seeks to draw all those who may be obedient to him the chalcedony was not inserted in the high priest's breastplate but instead the carbuncle of which no mention is made here it may well be however that the author designated the carbuncle by the name of chalcedony andrew then can be likened to the carbuncle since he was splendidly illumined by the fire of the spirit the emerald which is of a green color is nourished with oil that its transparency and beauty may not change we conceive this stone to signify john the evangelist he indeed soothed the souls dejected by sin with a divine oil and by the grace of his excellent doctrine lends constant strength to our faith by the sardonyx showing with a certain transparency and purity the color of the human nail 
we believe that James is denoted, seeing that he bore death for Christ before all others. This the nail by its color indicates, for it may be cut off without any sensible pain. The sardius, with its tawny and translucent coloring, suggests fire, and it possesses the virtue of healing tumors and wounds inflicted by iron. Hence I consider that it designates the beauty of virtue, characterizing the apostle Philip, for his virtue, animated by the fire of the Holy Spirit, cured the soul of the wounds inflicted by the wiles of the devil, and revived it. The chrysolite, gleaming with the splendor of gold, may symbolize Bartholomew, since he was illustrious for his divine preaching and his store of virtues. The beryl, imitating the colors of the sea and of the air, and not unlike the jacinth, seems to signify the admirable Thomas, especially as he made a long journey by sea, and even reached the Indies, sent by God to preach salvation to the peoples of that region. The topaz, which is of a ruddy color, resembling somewhat the carbuncle, stops the discharge of the milky fluid with which those having eye disease suffer. This seems to denote Matthew, for he was animated by a divine zeal, and, his blood being fired because of Christ, he was found worthy to enlighten, by his gospel, those whose heart was blinded, that they might, like newborn children, drink the milk of the faith. The chrysoprase, more brightly tinged with a golden hue than gold itself, symbolizes St. Thaddeus, the gold, or chrysos, symbolizing the kingdom of Christ, and the praesius, Christ's death, both of which he preached to Abgar, king of Edessa. The jacinth, which is of a celestial hue, signifies Simon Zelotes, zealous for the gifts and grace of Christ, and endowed with a celestial prudence. By the amethyst, which shows to the onlooker a fiery aspect, is signified Matthias, who in the gift of tongues was so filled with celestial fire and with fervent zeal to serve and please God, who had chosen him, that he was found worthy to take the place of the apostate Judas. Some theologians were opposed to the assignment of the foundation stones to the apostles, for they held that only Christ himself could be regarded as the foundation of his church. Hence the symbolism of these stones was made to apply to Christ alone, the color of the stone often guiding the commentator in his choice of ideas denoted by the different gems. Thus one writer, applying all the meanings to Christ, finds that the greenish jasper denotes satisfaction, the sky-blue sapphire, the soul, the bright red chalcedony, zeal for truth, the transparent green emerald, kindness and goodness, the nail-colored sardonyx, the strength of spiritual life, the red sardius, readiness to shed his blood for the church, the yellow chrysolite, the excellence of his divine nature, the sea-green beryl, moderation and the control of the passions, the glass-green topaz, or chrysolite, uprightness, the harsh-colored chrysoprase, sternness towards sinners, the violet or purple jacinth, royal dignity, and lastly, the purple amethyst, with a touch of red, perfection. Andreas of Caesarea freely recognizes his indebtedness to the much more ancient source, St. Epiphanius, Bishop of Constantia in Cyprus, who died in 402 AD, and who wrote a short but very valuable treatise on the stones of the breastplate, noting in several cases the therapeutic and talismanic virtues of these stones, and giving his opinion as to the order in which the names of the tribes were inscribed upon them. As the foundation stones of Revelation are rightly called apostolic stones, so those of the breastplate merit the designation of tribal stones, as well as that of astral stones. Indeed, the Jews of medieval times definitely associated the tribes with the zodiacal signs in the following order. Judah, Aries, Issachar, Taurus, Zebulun, Gemini, Reuben, Cancer, Simeon, Leo, Gad, Virgo, Ephraim, Libra, Manasseh, Scorpio, Benjamin, Sagittarius, Dan, Capricorn, Naphtali, Aquarius, Asher, Pisces. For Rabanus Marius, the nine gems of the king of Tyre, named in Ezekiel 38 verse 13, are types of the nine orders of angels, just as the twelve foundation stones of Revelation signify the twelve apostles. It is evident, from early and later usage, 
that at the place and time where and when these stones were first utilized for birth stones, the year must have begun with the month of March. This will be apparent when we compare the following eight lists carefully gathered from various sources. January. Jews. Garnet. Romans. Garnet. Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Hyacinth, Arabians, Garnet. February. Jews, Amethyst. Romans, Amethyst. Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Amethyst. Arabians, Amethyst. March. Jews, Jasper. Romans, Bloodstone. Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Jasper. Arabians, Bloodstone. April. Jews, Sapphire, Roman Sapphire, Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Sapphire, Arabians, Sapphire. May, Jews, Chalcedony, Carnelian, Agate, Romans, Agate, Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Agate, Arabians, Emerald. June, Jews, Emerald, Romans, Emerald, Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Emerald. Arabians, agate, chalcedony, pearl. July, Jews, onyx, Romans, onyx. Isidore, bishop of Seville, onyx. Arabians, carnelian. August, Jews, carnelian. Romans, carnelian. Isidore, bishop of Seville, carnelian. Arabians, sardonyx. September, Jews, chrysolite. Romans, sardonyx. Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Chrysolite, Arabians, Chrysolite. October, Jews, Aquamarine, Romans, Aquamarine, Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Aquamarine, Arabians, Aquamarine. November, Jews, Topaz, Romans, Topaz, Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Topaz, Arabians, Topaz. December, Jews, Ruby, Romans, Ruby, Isidore, Bishop of Seville, Ruby, Arabians, Ruby. January, Poles, Garnet, Russians, Garnet, Hyacinth, Italians, Jacinth, Garnet, 15th to 20th century, Garnet. February, Poles, Amethyst, Russians, Amethyst, Italians, Amethyst. 15th to the 20th century, amethyst, hyacinth, pearl. March, Poles, bloodstone, Russians, jasper, Italians, jasper. 15th to the 20th century, jasper, bloodstone. April, Poles, diamond, Russians, sapphire, Italians, sapphire. 15th to the 20th century, Diamond, Sapphire. May, Poles, Emerald, Russians, Emerald, Italians, Agate, 15th to the 20th century, Emerald, Agate. June, Poles, Agate, Chalcedony, Russians, Agate, Chalcedony, Italians, Emerald, 15th to the 20th century, Cat's Eye, Turquoise, Agate. July, Poles, Ruby, Russians, Ruby, Sardonyx, Italians, Onyx, 15th to the 20th century, Turquoise, Onyx. August, Poles, Sardonyx, Russians, Alexandrite, Italians, Carnelian, 15th to the 20th century, Sardonyx, Carnelian, Moonstone, Topaz. September, Poles, Sardonyx, Russians, Chrysolite, Italians, Chrysolite, 15th to the 20th century, Chrysolite. October, Poles, Aquamarine, Russians, Beryl, Italians, Beryl, 15th to the 20th century, Beryl, Opal. November, Poles, Topaz, Russians, Topaz, Italians, Topaz, 15th to the 20th century, topaz, pearl. December, poles, turquoise, Russians, turquoise, chrysoprase, Italians, ruby, 15th to the 20th century, 
Ruby, Bloodstone. It may be interesting to show in these eight lists the stones which are most favored in each month in the following way, the numerals indicating the number of lists in which the stones appear, including the alternate stones. January, Garnet, 7, Hyacinth, 2, February, Amethyst, 8, Hyacinth, 1, Pearl, 1, March, Jasper, 5, Bloodstone, 4, April, Sapphire, 7, Diamond, 2, May, Agate, 5, Emerald, 4, Chalcedony, 1, Carnelian, 1, June, Emerald, 4, Agate, 4, Chalcedony, 3, Turquoise, 1, Pearl, 1, Cat's Eye, 1, July, Onyx, 5, Sardonyx, 1, Carnelian, 1, Ruby, 1, Turquoise, 1, August, Carnelian, 5, Sardonyx, 3, Moonstone, 1, Topaz, 1, Alexandrite, 1, September, Chrysolite, 6, Sardonyx, 2, October, Beryl, 8, Aquamarine, 5, Opal, 1, November, Topaz, 8, Pearl, 1, December, Ruby, 6, Turquoise, 2, Chrysoprase, 1, Bloodstone, 1. With the exception of January, where we have the garnet instead of the jacinth, and of December, which gives us the ruby instead of the chrysoprase, the first choices are practically identical with the foundation stones, bearing in mind that the eleventh stone is that for January, the twelfth that for February, the first that of March, and so on. Of the assignment of the natal stones to the different months of the year, or to the zodiacal signs, Pouillet Fils, writing in 1762, states that in his opinion, this fashion started in Germany, others say in Poland, some two centuries before his time, and he adds that, though this arrangement was purely imaginary and unknown to ancient writers, it soon became popular, and many, more especially of the fair sex, seeing in it an element of mystery, wishes to wear rings set with the stone appropriate to the month of their birth, the stone being engraved with the appropriate zodiacal sign. However correct, Pouillet may be regarding the period at which the fashion of wearing natal rings was introduced. He is, as we have already shown, quite wrong in believing that the serial arrangement of the stones and their assignment to months or signs was purely imaginary, for it is unquestionably based on the list in Revelation, which in its turn goes back to the twelve stones of the high priest's breastplate. The fashion of wearing a series of twelve stones, denoting or bearing the zodiacal signs, seems to have existed in the 16th century, for Catherine de' Medici is said to have worn a girdle set with twelve stones, among which were certain onyxes as large as crown pieces, upon which talismaic designs had been engraved. Two hundred years later, this girdle is stated to have been in the possession of Monsieur Denery, whose collection of antique medals was regarded as the finest in Paris at the time. It is not, however, certain that the twelve stones of Catherine's girdle were those attributed to the zodiacal signs, both at an earlier and later period. Though the substitution of a new schedule for the time-honored list of birthstones has received the approval of the National Association of Jewelers at the meeting in Kansas City, August 1912, it can scarcely be said to offer a satisfactory solution of the question, which has its importance not only from a commercial point of view, but also because the idea that birthstones possess a certain indefinable, but nonetheless real significance, has long been present and still exercises a spell over the minds of all who are gifted with a touch of imagination, or romance if you will. The longing for something that appeals to this sense is much more general than is commonly supposed, and is a not unnatural reaction against the progress of materialism, against the assertion that there is nothing in heaven or earth but what we can definitely apprehend through our senses. It is this persuasion that should be chiefly considered in any attempt to tamper with the traditional attribution of the stones to particular months or to the zodiacal signs. Once we allow the spirit of commercialism, pure and simple, to dictate the choice of such stones, 
according to the momentary interest of dealers there is grave danger that only the true incentive to acquire birth stones will be weakened and people will lose interest in them sentiment true sentiment is one of the best things in human nature while if darkened by fear it may lead to pessimism with all the evils which such a state of mind implies if illumined by hope it gives to humanity a brighter forecast of the future an optimism that helps people over difficult passages in their lives thus sentiment must not be neglected and nothing is more likely to destroy it than the conviction that it is being constantly exploited for purposes of commercialism for this reason the interest as well as the inclination of all who are concerned in this question of birth stones should induce a very careful handling of the subject quite true it is that there are now and have been in the past several lists of stones differing slightly from one another but all are based essentially either upon the list of foundation stones given in revelation twenty one verse nineteen or upon that of the gems adorning the breastplate of Aaron and enumerated in Exodus 34, verses 10 through 13. For convenient reference, we give the latter according to the authorized version of the scriptures, and also as corrected by later research, and the former according to the authorized version. Breastplate. Authorized version. 1. Sardius. 2. Topaz. 3. Carbuncle. 4. Emerald. 5. Sapphire, 6. Diamond, 7. Ligure, 8. Agate, 9. Amethyst, 10. Beryl, 11. Onyx, 12. Jasper. Breastplate, later correction. 1. Carnelian, 2. Chrysolite or Peridot, 3. Emerald, 4. Ruby, 5. Lapis Lazuli, 6. Onyx, 7. Sapphire, 8. Agate, 9. Amethyst, 10. Topaz, 11. Beryl, 12. Jasper. Foundation Stones, Authorized Version, 1. Jasper, 2. Sapphire, 3. Chalcedony, 4. Emerald, 5. Sardonyx, 6. Sardius, 7. Chrysolite, 8. Beryl, 9. Topaz, 10. Chrysoprasis, 11. Jacinth, 12. Amethyst. While the arrangement differs in Revelation, the stones are nearly identical. For Chalcedonius, we should probably read Carcadonius, a name of the ruby. Sardonyx is the onyx of Exodus. The jacinth, or sapphire, is probably the ligure. The sapphire was the lapis lazuli, and sardius is equivalent to carnelian. There thus remains only the chrysoprase, which for some reason has substituted the agate. In the eventual association of the foundation stones with the months, the first, the jasper, was assigned to March, with which the month of the year was reckoned to begin. The list suggested and adopted in Kansas City reads as follows. January, birthstone, garnet. February, birthstone, amethyst. March, birthstone, bloodstone alternate stone, aquamarine, April, birthstone, diamond, May, birthstone, emerald, June, birthstone, pearl, alternate stone, moonstone, July, birthstone, ruby, August, birthstone, sardonyx, alternate stone, peridot, September, birthstone, sapphire, October, birthstone, opal, alternate stone, tourmaline, November, birthstone, topaz, December, birthstone, turquoise, alternate stone, lapis lazuli. Among the many changes in this list from that habitually followed, it will be noted that the ruby is transferred from December to July, changing places with the turquoise, which became the gem of December. This has been favored on the ground that the warmer colored gem was best adapted to the July birthstone, while the paler turquoise was best suited to a winter month when the sun's rays are feeble. The contrary, however, is true, for it is in winter that we seek for warmth, while in the heat of summer nothing is more grateful than coolness. This transposition is, in effect, 
simply a return to the ordering of these stones in the Polish list, which may perhaps have become popular in Europe in the 18th century through Marie Leschinka, the queen of Louis the Fifteenth. Another undesirable change takes the chrysolite, or peridot, from the place it has always occupied as the gem of September, and makes of it an alternate for August, with the sardonyx, while the sapphire, properly the gem for April, is made the birthstone for September. For October, neither the tourmaline nor the opal is as appropriate as the beryl, while for June, we should prefer the asteria to the moonstone as a substitute for the pearl. This suggested radical change or violation cannot be permitted. The time-honored ordering is familiar now to all who are interested in the matter, and any change, even if one apparently for the better, is liable to disturb the popular confidence in those who are supposed to be familiar with the subject. Above all, there should be no duplication or triplication of birthstones for any given month. The choice between a birthstone or an astral or zodiacal stone or the combination of these affording all the variety that is necessary or should be desired. End of chapter 9, part 1. Chapter 9, part 2 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz. Chapter 9, Birthstones, Part 2. As the diamond does not appear to have been known to the ancients, and is not given in any of the lists of birthstones before the last century, and as diamonds, like gold and platinum, may easily be used as accessories to other stones, would it not perhaps be better to omit the diamond from the lists of the stones of the months, and rather use these gems as a bordering or other ornate addition to the stone of the month? The pearl, which is not a stone in any sense of the word, should not appear in the list at all, but it can be worn in some device suggesting a sentiment, as, for instance, an emblem of purity, etc. The tourmaline, as a gem only known in modern times, or since the 18th century, seems out of place in the list of birthstones, which ought only to comprise precious or semi-precious stones, which have been known and worn from ancient times. Astral stones, or zodiacal stones, are terms used to designate those gems, which were believed to be peculiarly and mystically related to the zodiacal signs, while these signs constitute a twelve-fold division of the year, just as do the months, they do not exactly coincide with the latter, as now reckoned, but overlap them, so that the sign Aquarius, for instance, covers the period from January 21st to February 20th, that of Pisces, from February 21st to March 20th, that of Aries, the spring sign, from March 21st to April 20th, and so on down to Capricornus, which begins at the winter solstice. Thus every necessary opportunity is afforded for enlarging the selection of natal stones while preserving the traditional order of those appropriate to the months, an order which in its origin dates back to the early Christian centuries, and which, from the close relation with the sacred gems of the scriptures, it seems almost sacrilegious to violate by arbitrary changes. Then, in addition, we have the talismaic gems, or the stones of the twelve guardian angels, one set over all those born in each month. Here we have another time-honored list, differing from either of those mentioned above, so that, in almost, if not quite every case, each person has the choice between three different stones, as birth stones, or can have them combined in an artistic jewel, so as to profit by all the favorable influences promised by the old authorities. Thus there is absolutely no excuse for playing fast and loose with an ancient, popular, and quasi-religious belief in the special virtue of one particular stone for each month, and that one the gem long prescribed by usage. As it might seem appropriate that one born in the United States should wear a gem from among those which our country furnishes, the following list was sometime since prepared by the writer, not in any sense as a substitute for the real birth stones, but as possible accessory gems, when they were not identical. 
gems which might be worn from a spirit of patriotism. Of course, where the stone in question is really that traditionally recommended, the fact that it is at the same time an American gemstone is an added argument in its favor. January. Stones. Garnet. Rhodolite. Where found? Montana. New Mexico. Arizona. North Carolina. February. Stones. Amethyst. Where found? North Carolina. Georgia. Virginia. March. Stones. Californite. Where found? California. April. Stones. Sapphire. Where found? Montana. Idaho. May. Stones. Green tourmaline. Where found? Lake Superior. June. Stones. Moss agate. Where found? California. Montana. Wyoming. Arizona. July. Stone. Turquoise. Where found? New Mexico. California. Arizona. August. Stones. Golden barrel. Where found? California. Connecticut. North Carolina. September. Stones. Kunzite. Where found? California. October. Stones. Aquamarine. Where found? North Carolina. Maine. California. November. Stones. Topaz. Where found? Utah. California. Maine. December. Stones. Rubellite. Where found? Montana. The year is divided into four seasons or cycles, spring, summer, fall, and winter, and each season has its particular gem. The emerald is the gem of the spring, the ruby the gem of summer, the sapphire the gem of autumn, and the diamond the gem of winter. For spring, no precious stone is more appropriate than the emerald. Its beautiful color is that of nature, for nature clothes herself with green when she awakens from her long rest of winter, Having decked herself with green of the various tints and colors, she has selected a background by which a contrast is made for the flowers that come in the spring and summer and ripen into fruit and seeds of autumn. To be a seasonal gem, it must be rare, and the emerald is rare. Whether found in the mines of Bogota, whether mined in ancient times at Zabara in Egypt, or in the past century in the Ural Mountains, it has never been found in abundance. It is softer in color than the ruby, and less hard in structure. The ruby, although as a natal stone it belongs to December, is the gem of summer. It is born in hot climates. The pigeon's blood ruby in Burma, the pomegranate red in Ceylon, and the more garnet-hued type in Siam. These three equatorial countries produce the ruby. Those of large size are always rare, and this is the gem which Job valued more highly than any other although garnet may perhaps be a better rendering. It is on an equal plane in hardness, in composition, in crystalline structure, and in every way, with the sapphire. These are sister gems, structurally alike, yet varying in complexion, due to a slight difference, which some scientists think is not even dependent upon the coloring matter. The sapphire, the gem of autumn, the blue of the autumn sky, is a symbol of truth, sincerity, and constancy, Less vivid than its sister gem, the ruby, it typifies calm and tried affection, not ardent passion. It is therefore appropriate to the autumn season, when the declining sun no longer sends forth the fiery rays of summer, but shines with a tempered brilliancy. The diamond, the gem of winter, typifying the sun, is the gem of light. Its color is that of ice, and as the dewdrop or the drop of water from a mountain stream sparkles in the light of the sun, as the icicle sparkles in winter, and the stars on a cold winter night, so the diamond sparkles, and it combines and contrasts with all known gems. Like light, it illumines them just as the sun does the plants of the earth. The diamond, the gem of light, like light itself when broken into a spectrum, gives us all known colors, and by combining all these colors, it gives us white. Like gold, the diamond is made rare, so it must be searched for, and the mines and deposits contain less of these two substances in a given area than any other known materials. It is 30 to 100 times more rare than gold, for if gold occurs one part in 250,000, it can scarcely be worked with profit, 
while the diamond can be worked to advantage when found only one part in ten million yes even one part in twenty-five million and like gold it sometimes spurs the searcher on to wealth or to ruin as great nuggets of gold have occasionally been found so has a diamond been discovered large enough to make the greatest ruler pause to pay its price and one which it took an entire country to give to that ruler who sways his scepter over countries in which the world's greatest diamonds have been found when the god of the mines called his courtiers to bring him all known gems he found them to be all colors and tints and of varying hardnesses such as the ruby emerald sapphire etc etc he took one of each he crushed them he compounded them and said let this be something that will combine the beauty of all yet it must be pure and it must be invincible he spoke and lo the diamond was born pure as the dewdrop and invincible in hardness but when its ray is dissolved in the spectrum it displays all the colors of the gems from which it was made mine said the god must be the gem of the universe for my queen i will create one that shall be the greatest gem of the sea and for her he created the pearl gems of spring amethyst green diamond crystal barrel spinel or rubicelle pink topaz ovaline or peridot emerald gems of summer zircon garnet or demantoid and alvarite crystal beryl or alexandrite spinel pink topaz ruby fire opal gems of autumn hyacinth topaz sapphire jacinth cairngorm adamantine spar tourmaline oriental chrysolite gems of winter diamond rock crystal white sapphire turquoise quartz moonstone pearl labradorite sentiments of the months january natal stone garnet guardian angel gabriel his talismanic gem onyx special apostle simon peter his gem jasper zodiacal sign aquarius flower snowdrop no gems save garnets should be worn by her who in this month is born they will ensure her constancy true friendship and fidelity the gleaming garnet holds within its sway faith constancy and truth to one alway february natal stone amethyst guardian angel barkiel his talismanic gem jasper special apostle andrew his gem carbuncle zodiacal sign pisces flower primrose the february born may find sincerity and peace of mind freedom from passion and from care if she an amethyst will wear let her an amethyst but cherish well and strife and care can never with her dwell march natal stone jasper bloodstone guardian angel malkadiel his talismanic gem ruby special apostles james and john their gem emerald zodiacal sign aries flower ipomea violet who on this world of ours her eyes in march first opens may be wise in days of peril firm and brave where she a bloodstone to her grave who wears a jasper be life short or long will meet all dangers brave and wise and strong april natal stone diamond sapphire guardian angel ashmoday his talismanic gem topaz special apostle philip his gem carnelian zodiacal sign taurus flower daisy she who from april dates her years diamonds should wear lest bitter tears for vain repentance flow this stone emblem of innocence is known innocence repentance sun and shower the diamond or the sapphire is her dower may natal stone emerald guardian angel amriel his talismanic gem carbuncle special apostle bartholomew his gem chrysolite zodiacal sign gemini flower hawthorn who first beholds the light of day in spring sweet flowering month of may and wears an emerald all her life shall be a loved and happy wife 
no happier wife and mother in the land than she with emerald shining on her hand june natal stone agate guardian angel muriel his talismanic gem emerald special apostle thomas his gem beryl zodiacal sign cancer flower honeysuckle who comes with summer to this earth and owes to june her hour of birth with ring of agate on her hand can health long life and wealth command through the moss agate's charm the happy years ne'er see june's golden sunshine turn to tears july natal stone turquoise guardian angel verkiel his talismanic gem sapphire special apostle matthew his gem topaz zodiacal sign leo flower water lily the heaven blue turquoise should adorn all those who in july are born for those they'll be exempt and free from love's doubts and anxiety no other gem than turquoise on her breast can to the loving doubting heart bring rest august natal stone carnelian guardian angel hematiel his talismanic gem diamond special apostle james the son of alpheus his gem sardonyx zodiacal sign virgo flower poppy where a carnelian or for thee no conjugal felicity the august born without this stone tis said must live unloved alone she loving once and always wears if wise carnelian and her home is paradise september natal stone chrysolite guardian angel to suriel his talismanic gem jacinth special apostle lebius thaddeus his gem chrysoprase zodiacal sign libra flower morning glory a maid born when september leaves are rustling in the autumn breeze a chrysolite on brow should bind twill cure diseases of the mind if chrysolite upon her brow is laid follies and dark delusions flee afraid october natal stone beryl guardian angel bariel his talismanic gem agate special apostle simon zelotes his gem jacinth zodiacal sign scorpio flower hops october's child is born for woe and life's vicissitudes must know and lay a barrel on her breast and hope will lull those woes to rest when fair october to her brings the barrel no longer need she fear misfortune's peril november natal stone topaz guardian angel at nekiel his talismanic gem amethyst special apostle matthias his gem amethyst zodiacal sign sagittarius flower chrysanthemum who first comes to this world below with dear november's fog and snow should prize the topaz's amber hue emblem of friends and lovers true firm friendship is november's and she bears true love beneath the topaz that she wears december natal stone ruby guardian angel humiel his talismanic gem beryl special apostle paul his gem sapphire zodiacal sign capricornus flower holly if cold december give you birth the month of snow and ice and mirth place on your hand a ruby true success will bless where'er you do december gives her fortune love and fame if amulet of rubies bear her name hindu list of gems of the months april diamond may emerald june pearl july sapphire august ruby september zircon october coral november cat's eye december topaz january serpent stone february chandra canta march the gold sivalinga when the zodiacal signs were engraved on stones to give them special virtues and render them of greater efficacy for those born under a given sign the hebrew characters designating the sign or at least the initial character were often cut upon the gem as the letters in which the earliest of our sacred writings were written a peculiar sanctity was often ascribed to these hebrew characters 
which were perhaps the more highly valued that they were unknown to the owners of the gems and hence possess a certain air of mystery for them the subjoined list of the signs with the hebrew equivalents may be of interest on this account hebrew names of the signs of the zodiac libra mosnaid scorpio akrab sagittarius cassit capricornus gedi aquarius deli pisces dagim aries tale taurus shore gemini teomim cancer sartan leo aria virgo betula gems of weekdays sunday topaz or diamond the bairn is born on sun and sweet day is blithe and is bonny is happy and gay sunday's talismanic gem the pearl monday pearl crystal the bairn that is born on monan's sweet race is lovely in feature and fair in face monday's talismanic gem the emerald tuesday ruby emerald if tuisco assists at birth keeps apace the bairn will be born with a soul full of grace tuesday's talismanic gem the topaz wednesday amethyst lodestone but if woden be there many tears will he sow and the bairn will be born but for sadness and woe wednesday's talismanic gem the turquoise thursday sapphire carnelian Jove's presence at birth means a long sway to mow, for if birth on Thor's day, thou hast far, far to go. Thursday's talismanic gem, the sapphire. Friday, emerald, cat's eye. If Venus shall bless thee, thou shalt bless many living, for Frigga's bairn truly is loving and giving. Friday's talismanic gem, the ruby. Saturday, turquoise, diamond. Cedar Dag's bairn in sweat shall be striving, for Saturn has doomed it to work for a living. Saturday's talismanic gem, the amethyst. No gems have afforded more interest to the Oriental peoples than those that are known as phenomenal gems, that is, such as exhibit a phenomenal quality, either as a moving line, as in the crystal barrel cat's eye, or the quartz cat's eye or as a star, a class represented by the star sapphire and the star ruby, all these being considered to bring good fortune to the wearer. A splendid star sapphire is in the hilt of the sword, presented as an Easter gift to King Constantine of Greece, then Prince Constantine, by the Greeks of America, on Easter Day, 1913. This ornate and beautiful sword was made by Tiffany and Company. Then there is the Alexandrite cat's eye, which, in addition to its cato yant effect, changes from green to red, showing its natural color by day and glowing with a ruddy hue by artificial light. The cat's eye effect here is caused by a twinning of the crystal, that is, when the gem is cut with a dome, across the twinning line, this shows itself as a smooth band of white light, with a translucent or transparent space at one side, the line varying in sharpness and in breadth, as the illumination becomes more intense. If the light is very bright, the line is no wider than the thinnest possible silver or platinum wire. The quartz cat's eye, less distinct than the crystal barrel cat's eye, is also found in the east, and possesses the property that when cut straight across, an apparent striation in the stone produces the cat's eye effect, but the material is not so rich or brilliant, nor is the gem as beautiful as the true cat's eye. The Alexandrite variety of crystal barrel is colored by chromium and is diochroitic, appearing green when viewed in one direction and red in another. In artificial light, however, the green color is lost and the red alone becomes apparent. The moonstone, with its moon-like, silvery white light, changes on the surface as the light varies. This is due to a cadoyancy produced by a reflection caused by certain cleavage planes present in feldspar of the variety to which the moonstone belongs. Phenomenal gems for the days of the week. Sunday, sunstone. Monday, moonstone. Tuesday, star sapphire. Wednesday, star ruby. Thursday, cat's eye. Friday, alexandrite. Saturday, labradorite. 
fashion in some parts of the orient dictates the use of special colors for raiment and jewels to be worn on the different days of the week in siam deep red silks and rubies are appropriate for sunday wear white fabrics and moonstones are prescribed for monday light red garments and coral ornaments are favored for tuesday striped stuffs and jewels set with a cat's eye are considered the proper wear for wednesday green materials and emeralds are decreed for thursday silver blue robes and ornaments set with diamonds are chosen for friday and on saturday those who obey the dictates of fashion are clad in dark blue garments and wear sapphires of a similar hue our age is not satisfied with the marvelous progress of science which has rendered possible the realization of many of the old magician's dreams in spite of this there seems to be a growing tendency to revive many of the old beliefs which appeared to have been definitely discarded therefore we need not be surprised that the nineteenth century offers us a work on the magic art written precisely in the spirit that animated an agrippa or a porta in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries this work gives elaborate directions as to the manner in which the magus should proceed to perform his magic rites each day has its special and peculiar ritual sunday is the day for the works of light and on this day a purple robe should be worn and a tiara and bracelets of gold the ring placed on the finger of the operator should be of gold and set with a chrysolite or a ruby a white robe with silver stripes is to be worn on monday the day of the works of divination and mystery and the high priest of the mysteries wears over his robe a triple necklace of pearls crystals and selenites the tiara should be covered with yellow silk and bear in silver characters the hebrew monogram for gabriel as given by cornelius agrippa in his occult philosophy tuesday is assigned to the works of wrath and on this day the robe must be red the color of fire and blood with a belt and bracelets of steel the tiara should be a circlet of iron and a sword or a stylus is to be used in place of a wand the ring is set with an amethyst the day for the works of science is wednesday when a green robe is worn and a necklace of hollow glass beads filled with quicksilver the ring is adorned with an agate on thursday appointed for the works of religion or politics a scarlet robe is worn upon the forehead of the operator is bound a plate of tin engraved with the symbol of the planet jupiter and various mystic characters the ring bears either an emerald or a sapphire friday the day of venus is naturally dedicated to the works of love and the celebrant wears a sky blue robe his ring shows a turquoise and his tiara is set with lapis lazuli and beryl the works of mourning belong to saturday when a black or brown robe is worn embroidered in orange colored silk with mystic characters from the neck of the operator hangs a leaden medal bearing the symbol of the planet saturn and on his finger is a ring set with an onyx upon which a double-faced janus has been engraved while saturn was in the ascendant gems of the hours hours of the day seven chrysolite eight amethyst nine kunzite ten sapphire eleven garnet twelve diamond one jacinth two emerald three beryl four topaz five ruby six opal hours of the night seven sardonyx eight chalcedony nine jade ten jasper eleven lodestone twelve onyx one morion two hematite three malachite four lapis lazuli five turquoise six tourmaline wedding anniversaries one paper two calico three linen four silk five wood six candy seven floral eight leather nine straw ten tin twelve agate thirteen moonstone fourteen moss agate fifteen rock crystal glass sixteen topaz seventeen amethyst eighteen garnet nineteen hyacinth twenty china twenty-three sapphire twenty-five silver twenty-six star sapphire blue thirty pearl 
35 coral 39 cat's eye 40 ruby 45 alexandrite 50 gold 52 star ruby 55 emerald 60 diamond yellow 65 star sapphire gray 67 star sapphire purple 75 diamond end of chapter 9 part 2「Planetary and Astral Influences of Precious Stones The talismanic influence of the stones associated with the planets and also with the signs of the zodiac is closely connected with the early ideas regarding the formation of precious stones. In an old work on the occult properties of gems, we read, the nature of the magnet is in the iron, and the nature of the iron is in the magnet, and the nature of both polar stars is in both iron and magnet, and hence the nature of the iron and the magnet is also in both polar stars, and since they are Martian, that is to say, their region belongs to Mars, so do both iron and magnet belong to Mars. The author then proceeds to describe an analogous relation between a man and any natural object or product to which his imagination draws him, and shows that, if this object be one that stands in a sympathetic relation with the star beneath which the man was born, the man, the star, and the object will constitute a triplicity of great utility as an explanation of the particularly intimate relation between stars and precious stones, we read on page 12, Metals and precious stones usually lie with their first seeds deep down in the earth and require continuous moisture and a mild heat. This they obtain through a reflection of the sun and the other stars in the manifold movement of the heavens. Therefore, also, the metals and precious stones are nearest related to the planets and stars. Since these influence them most potently and produce their peculiar qualities, for they are enduring and unchangeable and show therein their concordance with the stars and the planets. Hence it is that the influence over human fortunes ascribed by astrology to the heavenly bodies is conceived to be strengthened by wearing the gem appropriate to certain planets or signs, for a subtle emanation has passed into the stone and radiates from it. A combination of several different stones, each partaking of this special quality, was believed to have an influence similar to that exercised by several planets in conjunction, that is, grouped in the same house or division of the heavens. The same is true of the stones dedicated to the guardian angels. The color and appearance of the stone was not merely emblematic of the angel, but by its sympathetic quality it was supposed to attract his influence and to provide a medium for the transmission of his beneficent force to the wearer. The whole theory, whether consciously or unconsciously, rested on the idea of harmony, of the accord of certain ethereal vibrations, either those of the visible light of the stars and planets, or the purely psychic emanations from the spiritual powers and principalities. The wearing of the appropriate zodiological gem was always believed to strengthen the influence of the zodiological sign upon those born under it, and to afford a sympathetic medium for the transmission of the stellar influences. The gem was thus something more than a mere symbol of the sign. The same was true of the stone of the saint who ruled over the month, and that of the holy guardian angel set over those born in the month. 
In each and every case, the material form and color of the stone was believed to attract the favor and grace of the saint or angel, who would see in the selection of the appropriate gem an act of respect and veneration on the part of the wearer. The old writers never tired of assisting upon the idea that, while the image graven upon a stone was in itself dead and inactive, the influence of the stars during whose ascendancy the work had been executed communicated to the inert material talismanic qualities and virtues which it before lacked. In these instances, the images could be regarded as outward and visible signs of the planetary or zodiacal influence. Even in the case of the bizarre stone, a generally recognized antidote for all sorts of poisons, it was held that the scorpion's bite could be most effectively healed by a bizarre upon which this creature's figure had been cut during the time when the constellation Scorpio was in the ascendancy. In the production of engraven stones to serve as amulets, the influence of the respective planet was made to enter the stone by casting upon the latter, during the process of engraving, reflections from a mirror which had been exposed to the planet's rays. In addition to this, the work was executed while the planet was in the ascendant, and the design was emblematic of it. With these combined influences, the gem was believed to be thoroughly impregnated with the planetary virtue. An old writer finds in the hardness of precious stones a reason for their retaining longer the celestial virtues they receive. After they have been extracted, these virtues persist in them, and they keep the traces and gifts of mundane life which they possessed while clinging to the earth. These Gifts of mundane life signify the stored-up energy derived from the stars and planets which penetrates the matter of the stone, and each stone is peculiarly sensitive to the emanations from a certain planet, star, or group of stars. A fine carnelian gem engraved with a design consisting of a star surrounded by the images of a ram, a bull, and a lion is described by M. Mehran. He sees in the star the emblem of the splendid comet which appeared shortly after the assassination of Caesar, and which, according to Suetonius, was believed to be the soul of Caesar newly received into the sky. The ram, bull, and lion are the symbols of the zodiacal signs Aries, Taurus, and Leo, the first name signed referring perhaps to the death of Caesar on the Ides, or 15th of March, while the other two signs may allude to the position of the comet at different dates. In the Cabinet du Roi in Paris, there was an engraved carnelian, the design showing Jupiter enthroned with thunderbolt and scepter, and Mars and Mercury standing on either side of the central figure. Separated from the gods of the upper air by a bow, probably representing the arch of the sky, appears the bust of Neptune, emerging from the sea. The border of the design is formed by the twelve signs of the zodiac, Virgo being of an unusual type, the virgin and unicorn, said to have been used only during the reign of Domitian, 81 to 96 AD. Some choice examples of astrological gems may be seen in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York. Among these is a green jasper, bearing symbols of Luna, Capricorn, and Taurus. This gem is from the collection of the late Reverend C. W. King, which has been acquired for the museum, and is described as figuring the horoscope of the owner. In the same collection is a banded agate, engraved with Sagittarius as a centaur, surrounded by the stars of this constellation in their proper order. King states that this was the earliest horoscopical gem known to him. Still, another gem of this collection is a sard bearing the symbol of Aries, carrying a long caduceus. This type appears on the coins of Antioch because the city was founded in the month over which the sign Aries presides. The Austrian imperial collection in Vienna contains the celebrated Gemma Augustia, sometimes called the Apotheosis of Augustus. 
This commemorates the Pannonian triumph of Tiberius, 13 AD, and above the figure of Augustus appears the sign of Capricornus, the constellation of his nativity. Beneath the figure of Tiberius is engraved the sign of Scorpio, under which that emperor was born. This celebrated cameo, the work of the famous gem engraver Dioscorides, is mentioned in an inventory of the treasury of St. Cernan in Toulouse, dated 1246. It is said to have been offered by Francis I of France to Pope Clement VII on the occasion of their meeting in Marseille in 1535. However, as the gem only reached Marseille two days after the Pope's departure, Francis decided to retain possession of it. The royal treasure at Fontainebleau was plundered in 1590, and the stone was offered for sale and was purchased in 1619 by Emperor Rudolf II for the sum of 12,000 ducats. A ruby called Sandastros is described by Pliny as containing stellated bodies which he compares to the hiatus. Hence, says he, they are the objects of great devotion of the Chaldei, or Assyrian Magi. According to Morales, de las piedras preciosas, the ruby and the diamond were both under the influence of the sign of Taurus. The same writer informs us that the hiatus and the sun were supposed to have a potent effect upon the ruby, or carbuncle. In ancient Babylonia, the sign of Taurus was regarded as the most important, and Winkler believes that the presence in this sign of the five stars of the Hiatus and the seven of the Pleiades was brought into connection with the twelve-fold division of the zodiac. The Hiatus signified the five signs visible in Babylonia at the summer solstice, while the Pleiades typified the seven invisible signs. It seems probable that the Pleiades were associated with the diamond, although Morales, who was very familiar with the Moorish astrology current among the Spaniards of his time, attributed the crystal to this group. His attribution proves at least that the stone of the Pleiades was a colorless one. In Sanskrit, the diamond is called Vara, thunderbolt, and also Indrahuda, Indra's weapon and another name is Asira, fire, or the sun. All these designations are probably suggested by the brilliant flashes of light emitted by this stone. It is not easy to determine the reason that induced the Hindus to dedicate the diamond to the planet Venus rather than to the sun or to the moon. However, as the most brilliant of the planets, Venus was not unworthy of this honor, and if we substitute the goddess of love for her planet, it seems quite appropriate that she should be adorned with the most brilliant of precious stones. Certainly, these sparkling gems are often enough offered at the shrine of Venus in our own day, and they often serve to win the good graces of the divinity to whom they are presented. The Sanskrit name for the sapphire, Nila, signifies blue, so that, as the topaz is the yellow stone par excellence, the sapphire is the blue stone, Nilakman. In both cases, the name indicates a variety of corundum, distinguished merely by the coloring matter. As a talisman, the Hindus believe that the sapphire rendered the planet Saturn favorable to the wearer, an important consideration from the astrological point of view, for Saturn's influence was generally supposed to be unfavorable. The Hindus distinguished four classes of sapphires corresponding to the four castes, Brahmins, Satriyas, Vayas, and Sudras. The respective sapphires were light blue, reddish blue, yellowish blue, and dark blue. The same distinction is made in the case of the diamond, and a like rule applies to both stones, namely, that only the appropriate stone should be worn by the members of each caste in order to profit by the virtues inherent in the sapphire or diamond. One of the Sanskrit appellations of the hyacinth, zircon, is Rahunatra, that is, the jewel dedicated to the mysterious dragon that was supposed to be the cause of the periodic eclipses of the sun and moon. 
as the stone was sacred to this malevolent influence, we need not be surprised that it was believed to avert misfortune, for nothing was so effective against the lesser spirits of evil as an, an evil genius of greater power. According to the Hindu mystics, it was very lucky to have a turquoise at hand at the time of the new moon, for whoever, after first looking at the moon on the Pratapada, the first day after the new moon, should cast his eye upon a turquoise, was destined to enjoy immeasurable wealth. Zodiacal Gems Aquarius, January 21 to February 21 The Garnet If you would cherish friendship true, in Aquarius well you'll do to wear this gem of warmest hue, the Garnet. Pisces, February 21 to March 21 The Amethyst from passion and from care kept free shall Pisces' children ever be, who wear so all the world may see the amethyst. Aries, March 21 to April 20. The Bloodstone. Who on this world of ours his eyes in Aries opens shall be wise if always at his hand there lies bloodstone. Taurus, April 20 to May 21. The Sapphire. If on your hand this stone you bind, you in Taurus born will find twill cure diseases of the mind. The Sapphire. Gemini, May 21 to June 21. The Agate. Gemini's children health and wealth command. And all the ills of age withstand who wear their rings on either hand of agate. Cancer, June 21 to July 22. The Emerald. If born in Cancer's sign, they say, your life will joyful be alway if you take with you on your way an emerald. Leo, July 22 to August 22. The onyx. When youth to manhood shall have grown, under Leo lorn and lone, twill have lived but for this stone, the onyx. Virgo, August 22 to September 22. The carnelian. Success will bless whate'er you do, through Virgo's sign, if only you place on your hand her own gem true. Carnelian. Libra, September 22 to October 23. The Chrysolite. Through Libra's sign it is quite well to free yourself from evil spell, for in her gem surcease doth dwell the Chrysolite. Scorpio, October 23 to November 21. The Beryl. Through Scorpio this gem so fair is that which every one should wear, or tears of sad repentance bear, the beryl. Sagittarius, November 21 to December 21, the topaz. Who first comes to this world below under Sagittarius should know that their true gem should ever show, a topaz. Capricorn. December 21 to January 21. The Ruby. Those who live in Capricorn no trouble shall their brows adorn if they this glowing gem have worn. The Ruby. An old Spanish list of the gems of the zodiacal signs differs from those given above and probably represents Arab tradition. Aries, crystal. Taurus, Ruby and Diamond, Gemini, Sapphire, Cancer, Agate and Beryl, Leo, Topaz, Virgo, Magnet, Libra, Jasper, Scorpio, Garnet, Sagittarius, Emerald, Capricorn, Chalcedony, Aquarius, Amethyst, Pisces, Left Blank. Of planetary stones, there is assigned to the sun the jacinth and the chrysolite, when this latter name was applied to the yellow Brazilian chrysoberyl, 
while the moon controls the beryl, the rock crystal, and also the pearl. To the share of Venus fall the sapphire and carbuncle, as well as coral and pearl. Usually the emerald is the stone of Venus. Mars lays claim to the diamond, jacinth, and ruby, the last named stone according with the ruddy hue of our neighbor planet. Under the control of Jupiter are placed the emerald, sapphire, amethyst, and turquoise, so that this planet has the richest assortment of gems. It will be remarked that the celestial sapphire unites the influence of Venus and Jupiter, the two especially propitious planets. Lastly, far away Saturn must be content with all dark, black, and brittle stones. There was indeed little inducement to wear a Saturnian stone, for the influence of this cold and distant planet was always regarded as baleful. The planetary controls of precious stones, as given in the Lapidario of Alfonso X, according to Chaldaic tradition, show that the same stone was influenced in many or most cases by more than one of the seven planets, including the sun and the moon. Thus the diamond, belonging to the first degree of the sign Taurus, was dominated by both Saturn and the sun. The emerald was controlled by Jupiter, and also by Mercury and by Venus. The red jargoon was influenced by Mars, the yellow variety by Jupiter, and the white jargoon by Venus. The carnelian received virtue from the sun and from Venus. The ruby, although more especially a sunstone, came as well under the influence of the planet of love. Coral belonged both to Venus and to the moon, while Lapis Lazuli and the Chalcedony only owed allegiance to Venus. This planet also lent virtue to the beryl. End of chapter 10, part 1. Recording by Richard Garifo. Chapter 10, part 2 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Garifo. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz. Among the Mohammedans, six of the seven heavens were supposed to be made of precious substances. The first was of emerald, the second of white silver, the third of large white pearls, the fourth of ruby, the fifth of red gold, and the sixth of jacinth. The seventh and highest heaven, however, was of shining light. Here we have the three precious colored stones, emerald, ruby, and sapphire, jacinth, to which is added the pearl. The scarcity of the diamond in early times, and its comparative lack of brilliancy before the invention of rose and brilliant cutting, account for the absence of this king of gems. Rebellier, describing the temple of the oracle of the Dive Bautier, says that of its seven columns, the first was of sapphire, the second of jacinth, the third of diamant, the fourth of the male balas ruby, the fifth of emerald, more brilliant and glistening than were those which were set in place of eyes in the marble lion stretched before the tomb of King Hermias. The sixth column was of agate, and the seventh of transparent selenite, with a splendor like that of Hamitian honey, and within appeared the moon in form and motion, such as she is in the heavens, full and new, waxing and waning. We are then told that these stones were attributed to the seven planets by the Chaldeans as follows. Sapphire, Saturn, Jacinth, Jupiter, Diamond, Sun, Ruby, Mars, Emerald, Venus, Agate, Mercury, Selenite, Moon. Some of these attributions differ from those usually made and may represent another tradition. 
planetary influences of stones. Jasper, Venus and Mercury. Sapphire, Jupiter and Mercury. Emerald, Venus and Mercury. Chalcedony, Jupiter, Mercury, and Saturn. Sardonyx, Saturn and Mars. Chrysolite, Mercury and Venus. Beryl, Venus and Mars. Topaz, Saturn and Mars. Chrysoprase, Mercury and Venus. Jacinth, Mars and Jupiter. Amethyst, Mars and Jupiter. Pearl, Venus and Mercury. Carbuncle, Mars and Venus. Diamond, Jupiter. Agate, Venus and Mars. Electoria, Sun. Turquoise, Venus and Mercury. Chelidon, Jupiter. Atitis, Sun. Dionysia, Saturn. Hermetite, Mercury. Lapis Lazuli, Venus. Armena, Mercury and Venus. Garnet, Sun. Amber, Sun. Jet, Saturn. Lycurius, Sun. Crystal, Moon and Mars. Bizarre, Jupiter. Armenia, Jupiter. Selenite, Moon. Magnet, Mars. Judaica, Hegonite or Koganite, Mercury. Iris, Jupiter. Halcyon, Saturn and Mars. Asbestos, Saturn. Sarcophagus, Moon. Arabian White, Moon. Arabian Green, Jupiter. Hyena, Sun. Andromedus, Moon. Pyrites, Copper Colored, Sun, Venus. Gold Colored, Sun. Silver Colored, Moon. Tin Colored, Moon, Saturn. Ash Colored, Jupiter. Calatia, Moon. Stalactite, Venus. Thenarchus, Sun. Carnelian, Jupiter, Mars, Venus. Opal, Sun, Mercury. Fixed Stars Associated with Precious Stones Diamond, Caput Algol, 18 degrees of Taurus. Crystal, the Pleiades, 24 degrees of Taurus. Ruby, Carbuncle, Aldebaran, 3 degrees of Gemini, also the Hyades. Sapphire, the Goat, 15 degrees of Gemini. Beryl, Sirius, 10 degrees of Cancer. Garnet, Heart of Lion, 23 degrees of Leo. Magnet, Tail of the Great Bear, 8 degrees of Scorpio, also the Pole Star. Topaz, right and left wing of Raven, 8 degrees of Libra. Emerald and Jasper, Spica Virginius, 17 degrees of Libra. Amethyst, Scorpion, 3 degrees of Sagittarius. Chrysolite, Tortoise, 8 degrees of Capricorn. Chalcedony, Tail of Capricorn, 15 degrees of Aquarius. Jacinth, Shoulder of Equus Major, 18 degrees of Pisces. Pearl, Umbilicus Andromedae, 20 degrees of Aries. Sardonyx, same as Topaz. Images and Virtues of the Constellations as Engraved on Gems Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and Draco. Both bears are represented in the folds of a serpent, the great bear in the upper and the lesser bear in the lower folds, in almost all the signs. Nature, Ursa Major, Mars, and Venus. Ursa Minor, Saturn. Draco, Saturn and Mars. Renders the wearer wise, cautious, versatile, and powerful. The boundary lines of the various signs are carried up to the pole, and any constellation that is within these lines is considered to belong to the respective signs. Thus, every constellation belongs to one or more signs. Corona Borealis, a royal crown with many stars, sometimes the crowned head of a king. Sign, Sagittarius. Nature, Venus and Mercury. Engraved on the stone of the one who is fitted for honors and knowledge, it gives him great favor with kings. Hercules, a man with knees bent, holding a club in his hand and killing a lion, sometimes a man with a lion's skin in his hand or on his shoulder and holding a club. Sign, Scorpio, Nature, Venus and Mercury. 
Engraved on a stone that brings victory, like the agate, it renders the wearer victorious in all conflicts in the field. Cygnus, a swan with outstretched wings and curved neck. In the north, nature, Venus and Mercury. Renders the wearer popular, increases knowledge, and augments wealth. Cures gout, paralysis, and fever. Cepheus, a man girt with a sword and holding his hands and arms extended. Sign, Aries, nature, Saturn and Jupiter. Causes pleasant visions if placed beneath the head of a sleeping person. Cassiopeia, a woman seated in a chair and with hands extended in the form of a cross, sometimes with a triangle on her head. Sign, Taurus, nature, Saturn and Venus. Restores the sickly, worn body to health, gives quiet and calm after labor, and procures pleasant and tranquil sleep. Andromeda, a young girl with disheveled hair and hands hanging down. Sign, Taurus, nature, Venus. Reconciles husband and wife, strengthens love, and protects the human body from many diseases. Perseus, a man holding a sword in his right hand and the gorgon's head in his left. Sign, Taurus. Nature, Saturn and Venus. Guards the wearer from misfortune and protects not only the wearer, but the place where it may be from lightning and tempest. Dissolves enchantments. Serpents. A man in the folds of a serpent and holding its head in his right hand and its tail in his left. Sign, Taurus, Nature, Saturn, and Venus. Antidote to poisons and to the bites of venomous creatures. Aquila, a flying eagle with an arrow beneath his feet. Sign, Cancer, Nature, Jupiter, and Mercury. The arrow, however, is of Mars and Venus. Preserves former honors, adds new ones, and helps to victory. Pisces, or Delphinius, figured in relief, Sign, Aquarius, Nature, Saturn, and Mars. If this engraved gem be attached to nets, it causes them to be filled with fish, and it renders the wearer fortunate in fishing. Pegasus. Some represent the half of a winged horse, others the whole figure and without a bridle. Sign, Aries, Nature, Mars, and Jupiter. Gives victory in the field and makes the wearer swift, cautious, and bold. Cetus, figure of a large fish with curved tail and capacious gullet. Sign, Taurus, nature, Saturn. Renders the wearer fortunate on the sea and makes him prudent and agreeable. It also restores lost articles. Orion, with or without armor, a man holding a sword or a scythe in his hand. Sign, Gemini, nature, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars gives the wearer victory over his enemies. Navis, a ship with prow curved back and spread sails, sometimes with and sometimes without oars. Sign, Leo, nature, Saturn, and Jupiter, renders the wearer fortunate in his undertakings. He runs no risk on sea or water, neither can he be injured by water. Canis Major, figure of a dog for coursing hares, with a curved tail. Sign, Cancer, Nature, Venus, cures lunacy, insanity, and demoniacal possession. Lepus, figure of a hare with ears pricked up and the feet represented as though in swift motion. Sign, Gemini, Nature, Saturn, and Mercury, cures frenzy and protects from the wiles of demons. The wearer cannot be hurt by a malignant spirit. Centaur, Half figure of a bull, bearing a man on whose left shoulder rests a lance, from which depends a hair. In his right hand, the man holds a small, supine animal with a vessel attached to it. Sign, Libra, Nature, Jupiter, and Mars. Gives constancy and perpetual health. Canis Minor, figure of a dog sitting. Sign, Cancer, Nature, Jupiter. Guards from dropsy, pestilence, and the bites of dogs. Sicarius, 
Terribolus, Ara, an altar with burning incense, sign Sagittarius, nature, Venus, and Mercury, gives the wearer power to recognize spirits, to converse with them, and to command them, also confers chastity. Hydra, a serpent, having an urn at its head and a raven at its tail, sign Cancer, nature, Saturn, and Venus gives riches and all good gifts to the wearer and makes him cautious and prudent. Corona Australis, an imperial crown, sign Libra, nature, Saturn, and Mars, augments wealth and makes the wearer gay and happy. Auriga, a man in a chariot bearing a goat on his left shoulder, sign Gemini, nature, Mercury, makes the wearer successful in hunting. Vexillum, a flag flying from the extremity of a lance. Sign, Scorpion, gives skill in war and confers victory in the field. Figures of the Planets Saturn, an old man holding a curved sigh in his hand and with a not very heavy beard. Engraved on a stone of the nature of Saturn, it renders the wearer powerful and augments his power continually. Jupiter, a seated figure, sometimes in a chariot, holding a staff in one hand and a spear in the other. It renders the wearer fortunate, especially if engraved on a cabratus stone, and he easily gains what he wishes, especially from priests. He will be raised to honors and dignities. Mars, represented sometimes with a banner and sometimes with a lance or other weapon. He is indeed always armed and at times mounted on a horse. Gives victory, boldness in war, and success in everything, especially if engraved on an appropriate stone. Sun, sometimes as the solar disk with rays, sometimes as a man in a chariot, and this occasionally is surrounded by the signs of the zodiac, renders the wearer powerful and a victor. This gem is prized by hunters. Venus, many forms, among them that of a woman in a voluminous dress and a stole, holding a laurel in her hand, gives skill in handling affairs, and usually brings them to a successful issue removes fear of drowning. Mercury, figure of a slender man, usually with a beautiful beard, but sometimes without. He has winged feet and holds the caduceus, increases knowledge and confers eloquence. It aids merchants, enabling them to acquire wealth. Moon, various forms, sometimes as a crescent, sometimes as a young woman in a chariot, and holding a quiver, and at others as a woman with a quiver, and following the chase with dogs. Aids the fortune of those who are sent on an embassy, and enables them to acquire wealth and honor thereby. Is said to confer speed and facility in undertakings, and a happy issue. When Hudibras attacked and overcame the sorcerer Sidrafal, he rifled the latter's pockets of all his mystic treasures. Among these were several constellation stones engraved in planetary hours that over mortals had strange powers to make them thrive in law or trade and stab or poison to evade in wit and wisdom to improve and be victorious in love. These manifold influences exerted by the stars and planets through the medium of the gems not only concerned those actually present in a material form, but also those that were seen in dreams, and interpretations of such dreams are given by old writers. Many honorocritica, or dream books, were written or compiled in the early centuries of our era, one of the most noted being the work of Artemodorus, who flourished in the 2nd century AD. Every object seen in a dream was given a special meaning, and it is interesting to note that Artemidorus believed dreams of rings or other ornaments, as well as of precious stones, to be of favorable significance only for women. Such dreams indicated marriage for unmarried women and the birth of children for those already married. 
If a woman was both wife and mother when she saw sparkling jewels in her dreams, then the vision portended the acquisition of great wealth. Artemidorus here sagely remarks that women are by nature devoted to riches and passionately fond of ornaments. For men, on the other hand, to dream of jewels was an ill omen, probably because it foreshadowed the necessity of buying them for a good friend or a faithful wife. Another of these dream books, probably composed in the 8th century AD, appears under the name of Acometus and is of Arabic origin. Many of the interpretations in this book are referred to a Hindu source, and among these are visions of crowns that appear to kings. Such a dream in itself usually portended increased power and success for the sovereign, but this depended upon the color and character of the jewels which adorned the crown. For example, we read that if the gems were red and of the kind known as lychnites, carbuncles or rubies, the dream indicated that the king would have great joy and good fortune, and would be more feared by his enemies than before. But if he saw blue gems in the crown, it was a bad omen, foreshadowing the loss of part of his kingdom. If the stones were of a light green hue, the color of a leek, the king would gain a great name in the world, both by his good faith and by the greatness of his kingdom. For, the writer adds, this color in precious stones is universally accepted as signifying good faith and religious devotion to God. There is signified by dreaming of agates, a journey, amber, a voyage, amethysts, freedom from harm, aquamarines, new friends, barrels, happiness in store, bloodstones, distressing news, carbuncles, acquirement of wisdom, carnelians, impending misfortune, cat's eyes, treachery, chalcedony, friends rejoined, chrysoberyls, a time of need, chrysolites, necessary caution, coral, recovery from illness, crystal, freedom from enemies, diamonds, victory over enemies, emeralds, much to look forward to, garnets, the solution of a mystery, heliotropes, long life, hyacinths, a heavy storm, jacinths, success, jasper, love returned, jet, sorrow, lapis lazuli, faithful love, Moonstones, impending danger. Moss agates, an unsuccessful journey. Onyx, a happy marriage. Opals, great possessions. Pearls, faithful friends. Porphyry, death. Rubies, unexpected guests. Sapphires, escape from danger. Sardonyx, love of friends. Topaz, no harm shall befall. Tourmalines, an accident. Turquoises, prosperity. If precious stones be so combined in a ring, or other jewel that the initial letters of their names spell words significant of a tender sentiment or implying good fortune, or else the name of someone dear to the giver of the jewel, this is also supposed to strengthen their astral or planetary influence and to render them more potent charms. In the following examples, the gems in the first column are the more expensive, those in the second column being comparatively inexpensive ones. Acrostics formed with stones. In France and England during the 18th century, rings, bracelets, brooches, etc., were often set with gems, the first letters of which, combined, formed a motto or expressed a sentiment. The following is a list of those that may be used in this way. The choice of stones afforded here brings these pretty devices within the reach of all. Faith, column one. Fire opal, alexandrite, iolite, tourmaline, hyacinth. Column two. Feldspar, amethyst, idocrase, topaz, heliotrope.
Hope, hyacinth, opal, pearl, emerald, hematite, olivine, pyrope, essonite. Charity, cat's eye, hyacinth, aquamarine, ruby, iolite, tourmaline, yellow sapphire. Carbuncle, hematite, amethyst, rose quartz, idocrase, topaz, yew, jade. Good luck. Golden beryl, opal, olivine, diamond, lapis lazuli, Eurelian emerald, cat's eye, kunzite. Garnet, onyx, obsidian, dendrite, labradorite, unio pearl, carnelian, crocodilite. Forever. Fire opal, opal, ruby, emerald, vermile, essonite, rubellite. Fleches de mor, onyx, rutile, essonite, verre d'antique, epidote, rose quartz. Regard, ruby, emerald, garnet, alexandrite, ruby, diamond. Rubellite, essonite, garnet, amethyst, rock crystal, demantoid. Zes, Greek meaning mayest thou live. Zircon, emerald, sapphire. Zonochlorite, essonite, sard. Mizpah, moonstone, indicolite, zircon, peridot, asteria, hyacinth. Moldavite, idocrase, zonochlorite, pyrope, aquamarine, hematite. Friendship, fleches de mor, ruby, indicolite, emerald, nephrite, diamond, sapphire, hyacinth, eolite, pearl. Feldspar, rock crystal, idocrase, epidote, nicolo, diopside, sard, hematite, idocrase, pyrite. Dearest, diamond, emerald, alexandrite, ruby, essonite, sapphire, turquoise. Demetoid, essonite, amethyst, rubellite, epidote, spinel, topaz. Souvenir, sapphire, opal, aurelian emerald, vermeil, emerald, nephrite, eolite, ruby. Sunstone, onyx, utilite, verd antique, epidote, nephrite, indicolite, rock crystal. Bonaire, beryl, opal, nephrite, hyacinth, emerald, aurelian emerald, ruby. Bloodstone, onyx, nephrite, hematite, essonite, utilite, rhodonite. Amite, alexandrite, moonstone, indicolite, tourmaline, idocrase, emerald. Almandine, moonstone, indicolite, topaz, idocrase, essonite. Love me, lapis lazuli, opal, vermeil, emerald, moonstone, essonite, Labrador spar, onyx, verdantique, essonite, moonstone, epidote. Ai, Greek meaning forever, eternity. Alexandrite, emerald, indicolite. Almandine, essonite, idocrase. An attractive engagement ring can be formed of a central diamond from which extend the rays of a five-pointed star. Between the rays are set the stones emblematic of the zodiacal sign, of the guardian angel of the month, of the planet control of the hour, and also the two stones indicating the initial letter of the two Christian names. This ring is in the form of the mystic pentagon, the grand symbol of constancy and durability, since the number five is composed of three, which signifies creative power, and two, which typifies the balance, that is, stability. As, according to the old fancy, the influences due to the light emanations from the planets or fixed stars, or from the combination of the stars and the zodiacal sign, 
would have a peculiar and more or less intimate connection with the fate of one country rather than of another. An attempt is here made to give a characteristic stone for each country. In the case of the United States, the various gemstones found within the boundaries of each of the states of the Union are given. That this special influence was exponentially potent in regard to those born in the countries in question was also taught, and hence a national gem would have a greater talismanic power than any other for the natives of each separate country. For those who may feel a certain degree of sympathy for time-honored fancies, and for who may perhaps also have a trace of superstition hidden away in some part of their consciousness, one of our state gems would have a similar significance. Gems of Countries Alaska, Garnet, Algiers, Coral, Arabia, Pearl, Austria-Hungary, Opal, Belgium, Crystal, Bohemia, Garnet, Bokhara, Lapis Lazuli, Bolivia, Lapis Lazuli, Brazil, Tourmaline, Brazilian Emerald, Burma, Ruby, Canada, Sodalite, Ceylon, Cat's Eye, Chile, Lapis Lazuli, China, Jade, Congo, Dioptes, Denmark, Agate, Egypt, Peridot, England, Diamond, France, Pearl, Germany, Amber, German West Africa, Diamond, Greece, Sapphire, Holland, Diamond, Hungary, Opal, India, Pearl, Ireland, Precious Serpentine, Connemara, Italy, Coral, Japan, Rock Crystal, Korea, Abalone Pearl, Madagascar, Morganite, Mexico, Obsidian, Morocco, Coral, New England, Tourmaline, New South Wales, Opal, New Zealand, Jade, Norway, Sweden, Carnelian, Panama, Agate, Persia, Turquoise, Peru, Emerald, Philippines, Pearl, Portugal, Chrysoberyl, Romania, Amber, Russia, Rhodonite, Sandwich Islands, Olivine, Scotland, Carngorm, Smoky Quartz, Servia, Coral, Siam, Ruby, Sicily, Amber, South Africa, Diamond, Spain, Emerald, Switzerland, Rock Crystal, Turkestan, Jade, Turkey, Turquoise, United States, Sapphire, Uruguay, Amethyst, United States Stones. Precious, semi-precious, or gemstones are found in nearly every state of the Union. The most important are enumerated below. Alabama, beryl, blue and yellow, smoky quartz. Arizona, agatized wood, azure malachite, turquoise, garnet, peridot. Arkansas, rock crystal, smoky quartz, agate, diamond, novacolite. California, agate, Benetoite, Californite, Diamond, Gold Quartz, Tourmalite, Abalone Pearl, Chrysoprase, Kunzite, Morganite, Colorado, Beryl, Aquamarine, Phenocyte, Garnet, Amethyst, Agate, Gold Quartz, Pyrite, Connecticut, Beryl, Yellow and Green, Rose Quartz, Tourmaline, Delaware, Pearl, Florida, Chalcedony, conch pearl. Georgia, ruby, beryl, amethyst, gold quartz, garnet. Idaho, opal, agate, obsidian. Illinois, fluorite, pearl. Indian Territory, obsidian, pearl. Indiana, pearl. Iowa, fossil coral, pearl, chalcedony. Kansas, chalcedony. Kentucky, pearl. Louisiana, Chaseldony, Maine, Tourmaline, Beryl, Rose Quartz, Pearl, Topaz, Amazonite, Smoky Quartz, Rock Crystal, Maryland, Beryl, Clam Pearl, Massachusetts, Beryl, Michigan, Agate, Hermitite, Minnesota, Chlorastrolite, Thomasite, Agate, Mississippi, Pearl, Chaseldony, Missouri, 
pearl, fluorite, pyrite. Montana, sapphire, beryl, smoky quartz, agate, amethyst, agatized wood, obsidian. Nebraska, chaseldony, pearl. Nevada, gold quartz, rock crystal. New Hampshire, beryl, rock crystal, garnet. New Jersey, phalerite, willamite, prehnite, smoky quartz, agate, pearl. New Mexico, turquoise, garnet, obsidian, peridot, rock crystal. New York, beryl, brown tourmaline, rose quartz, freshwater pearl, clam pearl, chondrodite. North Carolina, aquamarine, beryl, emerald, almadite garnet, rhodolite, propate garnet, diamond, cyanite, hidden dite, amethyst, ruby, sapphire, smoky quartz, rock crystal, rutile. North Dakota, chaseldony, agate, Ohio, fossil coral, chaseldony, Oregon, agate, obsidian, hydrolite, Pennsylvania, Amethyst, beryl, sunstone, moonstone, amazonite, almadite, garnet, pyrope, garnet, rutile. Rhode Island, hornblende in quartz, amethyst, rock crystal. South Carolina, beryl, smoky quartz, rock crystal. South Dakota, quartzite, beryl, agate. Tennessee, pearl. Texas, beryl, pearl, tourmaline. Utah, topaz, garnet. Virginia, amethyst, spessarite, garnet, beryl, moonstone, stolarite, alanite. Vermont, beryl, pearl. Washington, pearl, agate. West Virginia, rock crystal. Wisconsin, agate, pearl. Wyoming, moss agate, agate. End of chapter 10, part 2. Recording by Richard Garifo. Chapter 11, Part 1 of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in December 2018. The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz Chapter 11 On the Therapeutic Use of Precious and Semi-Precious Stones The medicinal use of precious stones may be traced back to very ancient times. It has been conjectured that their employment for such purposes was introduced to Europe from India, whence many of the stones were derived. Nevertheless, the earliest evidence we have rather points to Egypt as the source, and, indeed, it appears that in early Egyptian times the chemical constituents of the stones were much more rationally considered than at a later period in Europe. The Ebers papyrus, for instance, recommends the use of certain astringent substances, such as lapis lazuli, as ingredients of eye salves, and hematite, an iron oxide, was used for checking hemorrhages and for reducing inflammations. Little by little, however, superstition associated certain special virtues with the color and quality of precious stones, and their virtues were thought to be greatly enhanced by engraving on them the image of some god, or of some object symbolizing certain of the activities of nature. Later still, the science of astrology, most highly developed in Assyria and Babylonia, was brought into combination with the various superstitions above indicated, so that the image was believed to have much greater efficacy if the engraving were executed when the sun was in a certain constellation, or when the moon or someone of the planets was in the ascendant at the time. If we exclude certain fragmentary notices in Egyptian literature, notably the statements in the Ebers papyrus, and the very uncertain sources in Hindu literature, the earliest authority for this branch of the subject is the natural history of Pliny. In this connection, however, it is only just to call attention to a fact which has been often ignored, 
namely that Pliny himself had very little faith in the teachings of the Magi, as he calls them, in regard to the superstitious use of gems for the prevention or cure of diseases. Indeed, he seems to have been almost as sceptical in his attitude as many modern writers, for certain quite recent authorities still credit amber and a few other mineral substances with therapeutic effects other than those which can be explained by the known action of their chemical constituents. Still, Pliny yielded so far to the taste of his time as to preserve for us many of the statements of earlier writers on the subject, naming them in most cases, and so enabling us to form some idea of the character of this pseudo-science in the Roman world, in the first century of our era. With the gradual decay of ancient learning, the less valuable elements of popular belief came more and more into the foreground, and the old superstitions were freely copied by successive authors, each of whom felt called upon to add something new on his own account. This explains much of the confusion that reigns in regard to the attribution of special virtues to the different stones, for the wider the reading of the author, the greater became the number of virtues attributed to each separate stone, until, at last, we might almost say that each and every precious stone could be used for the cure of all diseases. Nevertheless, it is comparatively easy to see that either the colour or constitution of the stone originally indicated its use for this or that disease. A distinction is often made between the talismanic qualities of precious stones for the cure or prevention of disease and the properly medicinal use of them as mineral substances. In the former case, the effect was attained by merely wearing them on the person, while in the latter case they were reduced to a powder, which was dissolved as far as possible in water or some other liquid, and then taken internally. As, however, the end to be attained is the same whether the stone be worn or taken internally as a power or liquid, it seems more logical to treat of both these methods of therapeutic use together, reserving for the chapter on the talismanic use of gems only their employment to avert misfortunes other than those caused by disease, and their influence in the procuring of wealth, honours and happiness for their wearers. The belief in the curative properties of precious stones was at one time universal among all those to whom gems were known. When we read today of the various ills that were supposed to be cured by the use of these gems, we find it difficult to understand what process of thought could have suggested the idea of employing such ineffectual remedies. It is true that the constituents of certain stones can be absorbed by the human body and have a definite effect upon it, but the greater part of the elements are so combined that they cannot be assimilated, and they pass through the system without producing any apparent effect. In ancient and medieval times, however, other than chemical agencies were supposed to be efficient in the cure of diseases, and the primitive animistic conception of the cause of illness, and hence of the therapeutics of disease, long held sway among those who practiced the medical art. Remedies were prized because of their rarity, and also because it was believed that certain spiritual or planetary influences had aided in their production and were latent in them. Besides this, the symbolism of color played a very important part in recommending the use of particular stones for special diseases. This may be noted in the case of the red or reddish stones, such as the ruby, spinel, garnet, carnelian, bloodstone, etc. These were thought to be sovereign remedies for hemorrhages of all kinds, as well as for all inflammatory diseases. They were also believed to exercise a calming influence and to remove anger and discord. The red hue of these stones was supposed to indicate their fitness for such use, upon the principle similia similibus curantur. In the same way, yellow stones were prescribed for the cure of bilious disorders, for jaundice in all its forms, and for other diseases of the liver. The use of green stones to relieve diseases of the eye was evidently suggested by the beneficial influence exerted by this colour upon the sight. The verdant emerald represented the beautiful green fields, 
upon which the tired eye rests so willingly, and which exerts such a soothing influence upon the sight when it has been unduly strained or fatigued. One of the earliest, probably the very earliest, reference in Greek writings to the therapeutic value of gems appears in the works of Theophrastus, who wrote in the third century before Christ. Here we are told of the beneficial effect exercised by the emerald upon the eyes. The sapphire, the lapis lazuli, and other blue stones, with a hue resembling the blue of the heavens, were believed to exert a tonic influence, and were supposed to counteract the wiles of the spirits of darkness, and procure the aid and favor of the spirits of light and wisdom. These gems were usually looked upon as emblems of chastity, and for this reason the sapphire came to be regarded as especially appropriate for use in ecclesiastical rings. Among purple stones, the amethyst is particularly noteworthy. The well-known belief that this gem counteracted the effects of undue indulgence in intoxicating beverages is indicated by its name, derived from methuo, to be intoxicated, and the privative alpha, the name thus signifying the sobering gem. It is not unlikely that a fancied resemblance between the prevailing hue of these stones and that of certain kinds of wine first gave rise to the name and to the idea of the peculiar virtues of the amethyst. We have mentioned only a few of the more obvious analogies suggested by the color of gems, and we might be tempted to cite many others, were it not that symbolism is always treacherous ground, since there is practically no limit to the correspondences that may be found between sensuous impressions and ideas. One great difficulty which besets anyone who is trying to find a clue to guide him through the labyrinth of the medical affinities of gems is the fact that there was, from an early period, a tendency to attribute the virtues of one gem to another, probably owing to the commercial instinct which urged the dealer to praise his wares in every possible way, so that no part of his stock should fail to find a purchaser. This tendency is especially marked in the old Hindu lapidaries, wherein it is almost impossible to find any differentiation of the stones in respect to their curative or talismanic virtues. Only the condition and perfection of the gems are made the criterion of their worth. Any given stone, if perfect, was a source of all blessings to the wearer and possessed all remedial powers, while a defective stone, or one lacking the proper luster or color, was destined to be a source of untold misfortune to the owner. The European writers on the medical properties of precious stones were influenced by quite different considerations. Their chief aim was to represent each stone, regarded simply as a mineral substance, as being the abode of the greatest possible number of curative properties. Indeed, many of the most highly recommended electuaries contained all kinds of stones, as though the effect to be produced did not depend upon the qualities of any single stone or class of stones, but rather upon the quantity used. In Arnobio's Tesore delle Giore, we have a receipt for the composition of the most noble electuary of jacinth. This contains jacinth, emerald, sapphire, topaz, garnet, pearl, ruby, white and red coral, and amber, as well as many animal and vegetable substances, in all 34 ingredients. It would indeed seem that a good dose of such a mixture should have provided a cure for all the ills that flesh is heir to, by the simple and effective means of removing the unhappy patient to a better world. Treating of the metallic affinities of precious stones, Paracelsus, 1493 to 1541, affirmed that the emerald was a copper stone, the carbuncle and the jasper were golden stones, the ruby and the chalcedony silver stones. The white sapphire, corundum, was a stone of Jupiter, while the jacinth was a mercurial stone. Powdered jacinth mixed with an equal quantity of laudanum was recommended as a remedy for fevers resulting from putrefaction of the air or water. 
this illustrates the custom of combining an inefficacious material such as the powder of a precious stone with another possessing genuine remedial virtue the name of the stone appealing to the popular superstitions regarding its therapeutic powers and thus rendering the preparation more acceptable it is related by plutarch that when pericles was dying of the plague he showed to one of his friends who was visiting him an amulet suspended from his neck this had been given to pericles by the women of his household and plutarch cites the instance as a proof that even the strongest minds will at certain times yield to the influence of superstition there were sceptics in ancient times who put no faith in the popular superstitions as to the curative powers of precious stones eusebius circa 264 to circa 349 in his oration on the emperor constantine the great 272 to 337 says he held that the varieties of stones so greatly admired were useless and ineffective things they possessed no other qualities than their natural ones and hence no efficacy to hold evils aloof for what power can such things have either to cure disease or to avert death nevertheless although he well knew this he was in no wise opposed to their use simply as ornaments by his subjects the middle high german didactic poem on precious stones composed by volmar or volamar about twelve fifty appears to have been written as a rejoinder to a satirical poem the work of a writer called the stricker rascal what chiefly aroused volmar's wrath was the fact that this irreverent personage dared to assert that a piece of coloured glass set in a ring looked just as well and possessed the same virtues as a genuine precious stone of the same colour volmar does not mince matters and roundly declares that whoever should kill the man who wrote thus would do no sinful act while we can scarcely recommend such drastic action we must admit that we feel a little sympathy with the medieval champion of genuine stones against imitations a most interesting item recording one phase of a great tyrant's character is reported by sir jerome horsey who was entrusted with messages to and from elizabeth of england and ivan the terrible of russia he gives in his travels a graphic recital of an interview with ivan just before the latter's death in fifteen eighty four we retain the archaic spelling as it is reproduced in the hacklite publication from the original manuscript writing of ivan horsey says carried every day in his chair into his treasure one day the prince beckoned me to follow i strode among the rest venturously and heard him call for some precious stones and jewels told the prince and nobles present before and about him the virtue of such and such which i observed and do pray i may a little digress to declare for my own memory's sake the lodestone you all know hath great and hidden virtue without which the seas that compass the world are not navigable nor the bounds nor circles of the earth cannot be known mahomet the persian's prophet his tomb of steel hangs in the repata at darbent most miraculously caused the waiters to bring a chain of needles touched by his lodestone hanged all one by the other this fair curl coral and this fair turcus you see take in your hand of this nature are orient colours put them on my hand and arm i am poisoned with disease you can see they show their virtue by the change of their pure colour into pall declares my death reach out my staff royal an unicorn's horn garnished with very fair diamonds rubies sapphires emeralds and other precious stones that are rich in value cost seventy thousand marks sterling of david gower from the falkers of ausborg seek out for some spiders caused his physicians johannes loff to scrape a circle thereof upon the table put within it one spider and so one other and died and some other without that ran a life apace from it it is too late it will not preserve me behold these precious stones 
this diamond is the orient's richest and most precious of all other i never affected it it restrains fury and luxury and abstinacy and chastity the least parcel of it in powder will poison a horse given to drink much more a man points at the ruby oh this is most comfortable to the heart brain vigour and memory of man clarifies congealed and corrupt blood then at the emerald the nature of the rainbow this precious stone is an enemy to uncleanness the sapphire i greatly delight in it preserves and increases courage joys the heart pleasing to all the vital senses precious and very sovereign for the eyes clears the sight takes away bloodshot and strengthens the muscles and strings thereof then takes the onyx in hand all these are god's wonderful gifts secrets in nature and yet reveals them to man's use and contemplation as friends to grace and virtue and enemies to vice i faint carry me away till another time some believed that when precious stones were worn to relieve or prevent disease it was important that the different stones should be worn on different parts of the body according to one authority the jacinth should be worn on the neck the diamond on the left arm the sapphire on the ring finger the emerald or the jacinth on the index finger and the ruby or turquoise on either the index finger or the little finger there is however little reason to assume that these rules were generally known and observed that precious stones not only appealed to the eye by their beautiful colors but also possessed a fragrant odor was one of the many fanciful ideas regarding them if we could believe the following circumstantial account this was once experimentally proved when precious stones are to be used in medicine they must be pulverized until they are reduced to a powder so fine that it will not grate under the teeth or in the words of galen this power must be as impalpable as that which is blown into the eyes since this trituration is not usually operated with sufficient care by the apothecaries i begged a medical student who was lodging with me to pass an entire month in grinding some of these stones i gave him emeralds jacinths sapphires rubies and pearls an ounce of each kind as these stones were rough and whole he first crushed them a little in a well-polished iron mortar using a pestle of the same metal afterward he employed a pestle and mortar of glass devoting several hours each day to this work at the end of about three weeks his room which was rather large became redolent with a perfume agreeable both from its variety and sweetness this odour which much resembled that of march violets lingered in the room for more than three days there was nothing in the room to produce it so that it certainly proceeded from the powder of precious stones End of chapter 11, part 1chapter eleven part two of the curious lore of precious stones this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by avayi in february two thousand nineteen the curious lore of precious stones by george frederick kuntz chapter eleven part two diamond of the many medicinal virtues attributed to the diamond one of the most noteworthy is that of an antidote for poisons strangely enough the belief in its efficacy in this respect was coupled with the idea that the stone in itself was a deadly poison the origin of this latter fancy must be sought in the tradition that the place wherein the diamonds were generated in the land where it is six months day and six months night was guarded by venomous creatures who in passing over the stones were wounded by the sharp points of the crystals and thus imbued the stones with some of their venom the attribution of curative properties in case of poisoning arose from association of ideas the lapidario of alfonso x recommends the diamond for diseases of the bladder 
It adds, however, that this stone should be used only in desperate cases. The diamond was also believed to afford protection from plague or pestilence, and a proof of its powers in this direction was found in the fact that the plague first attacked the poorer classes, sparing the rich, who could afford to adorn themselves with diamonds. Naturally, in common with other precious stones, this brilliant gem was supposed to cure many diseases. Marbodas tells us that it was even a cure for insanity. In the Babylonian Talmud, we read of a marvelous precious stone belonging to Abraham. This was perhaps a diamond, or possibly a pearl, the accounts vary, and the same word is often used to designate precious stone and pearl. The following version represents it to be a diamond. R. Simeon ben Yohanan said, A diamond was hanging on Abraham's neck, and when a sick man looked upon it, he was cured. And when Abraham passed away, the Lord sealed it in the planet of the sun. The Hindus believed that it was extremely dangerous to use diamonds of inferior quality for curative purposes, as they would not only fail to remedy the disease for which they were prescribed, but might cause lameness, jaundice, pleurisy, and even leprosy. As to the use of diamonds of good quality, very explicit directions are given. On some day, regarded as auspicious for the operation, the stone was to be dipped in the juice of the Kantakara, Solanium jakiri, and subjected for a whole night to the heat of a fire made by dried pieces of the dung of a cow or of a buffalo. In the morning it was to be immersed in cow's urine and again subjected to fire. These processes were to be repeated for seven days, at the end of which term the diamond could be regarded as purified. After this, the stone was to be buried in a paste of certain leguminous seeds mixed with azafoetida and rock salt. Herein it was to be heated twenty-one successive times, when it would be reduced to ashes. If these ashes were then dissolved in some liquid, the potion would conduce to longevity, general development of the body, strength, energy, beauty of complexion, and happiness, giving an adamantine strength to the limbs. An Austrian nobleman, who for a long time had not been able to sleep without having terrible dreams, was immediately cured by wearing a small diamond set in gold on his arm, so that the stone came in contact with his skin. The fact that in this case, as in many others, the stone was required to touch the skin, proves that the effect supposed to be produced was not altogether magical, but in the nature of a physical emanation from the stone to the body of the wearer. We are told that when Pope Clement VII was seized by his last illness in 1534, his physicians resorted to powders composed of various precious stones. In the space of fourteen days they are asserted to have given the Pope forty thousand ducats worth of these stones, a single dose costing as much as three thousand ducats. The most costly remedy of all was a diamond administered to him at Marseille. Unfortunately, this lavish expenditure was of no avail. Indeed, according to our modern science, the remedies might have sufficed to end the Pope's life, without the help of his disease. The old fancy that the diamond grew dark in the presence of poison is explained by the Italian physician Gonelli as caused by minute and tenuous particles which emanated from the poison, impinged upon the surface of the diamond, and, unable to penetrate its dense mass, accumulated on the surface, thus producing a superficial discoloration. The diamond, being a cold substance, may have condensed moisture from the body, and the one suffering from the poison may have emitted exudations. But this elaborate explanation of a phenomenon which never existed, except in the imagination of those who related it, is characteristic of Gonelli, who was always ready to elucidate in some similar way any of the marvels recounted in regard to precious stones. Emerald the emerald was employed as an antidote for poisons and for poisoned wounds, as well as against demoniacal possession. 
if worn on the neck it was said to cure the semitertian fever and epilepsy the use of the emerald to rest and relieve the eye is the only remedial use of a precious stone mentioned by theophrastus in his treatise on gems written in the third century b c alluding to its powers as an antidote for poisons rueus asserts that if the weight of eighty barley corns of its powder were given to one dying from the effects of poison the dose would save his life the arabs prized emeralds highly for this purpose and abenzoar states that having once taken a poisonous herb he placed an emerald in his mouth and applied another to his stomach whereupon he was entirely cured a certain cure for dysentery also was to wear an emerald suspended so that it touched the abdomen and to place another emerald in the mouth michele pascali a learned spanish physician of the sixteenth century declared that he had effected a cure of the disease by means of the emerald in the case of juan de mendoza a spanish grandee and wolfgang gabelkova of kalf in württemberg writing in sixteen o three asserts that he had often tested the virtues of the emerald in cases of dysentery and with an invariable success it speaks not a little for the beauty of the emerald that so good a judge of precious stones as pliny should have pronounced this gem to be the only one that delighted the eye without fatiguing it adding that when the vision was wearied by gazing intently at other objects it gained renewed strength by viewing an emerald so general in the early centuries of our era was the persuasion that the pure green hue of emeralds aided the eyesight that gem engravers are said to have kept some of them on their work tables so as to be able to look at the stones from time to time and thus relieve the eye strain caused by close application to their delicate task Sellers says that a cataplasm made of emeralds was of help to those suffering from leprosy. He adds that if pulverized and taken in water, they would check hemorrhages. They were especially commended for use as amulets to be hung on the necks of children, as they were believed to ward off and prevent epilepsy. If, however, the violence of the disease was such that it could not be overcome by the stone, the latter would break hermes trismegistus says the emerald cures ophthalmia and hemorrhages the great hermes must have had a special preference for this stone since his treatise on chemistry pericemeas is said to have been found inscribed on an emerald by the hindu physicians of the thirteenth century the emerald was considered to be a good laxative it cured dysentery diminished the secretion of bile and stimulated the appetite in short it promoted bodily health and destroyed demoniacal influences in the curious phrase of the school the emerald was cold and sweet teifashi twelve forty two a d believed that the emerald was a cure for hemoptysis and for dysentery if it were worn over the liver of the person affected to cure gastric troubles the stone was to be laid upon the stomach furthermore the wearer was protected from the attacks of venomous creatures and evil spirits were driven from the place where emeralds were kept the direction to place the stone on the affected part a recommendation often met with in the treatises on the therapeutic use of ornamental stones shows that these were believed to send forth emanations of subtle power probably enough the brilliant play of reflected light which proceeds from many of these gems suggested the idea that they radiated a certain curative energy this theory need not surprise us for although it is altogether fanciful in the case of the diamond ruby emerald etc the newly discovered substance radium really possesses the active properties ascribed by old writers to precious stones jade a stone the therapeutic quality of which was specialized is the jade or nephrite strange to say although there are very few places where this mineral can now be obtained 
the chief sources of supply being the province of Khotan in Turkestan and New Zealand, in prehistoric times the stone must have been found in many different localities, since axe heads and other artifacts of jade have been discovered in many lands both of the old and new world. When the Spaniards discovered and explored the southern part of the American continent, they came across numerous native ornaments and amulets made of jade, jadeite, and brought many of these with them to Europe. The name jade is derived from the Spanish designation, piedra de hijada, meaning literally stone of the flank, which is said to have been bestowed on the stone because the Indians used it for all diseases of the kidneys. The name nephrite owes its origin to the same idea. In ancient times, jade appears to have been looked upon as a great aid in parturition, and many ingenious conjectures have been advanced as to the connection between this belief and the form of some of the prehistoric objects made of this material. Whether the Spaniards really learned from the Indians that the stone was especially adapted to cure renal diseases, or whether they only suggested this special and peculiar virtue in order to give an enhanced value to their jade ornaments, is a question not easily answered. An early notice of jade as a remedial agent appears in Sir Walter Raleigh's account of his travels in Guyana. Treating of a people of Amazons said to dwell in the interior of the country, Raleigh says, these Amazons have likewise great store of these plates of gold, which they recover by exchange, chiefly for a kind of green stone, which the Spaniards call piedras hijadas, and we use for spleen stones, and for the disease of the stone we also esteem them. Of these I saw divers in Guyana, and commonly every king or cacique hath one, which their wives for the most part wear and they esteem them as great jewels. By the middle of the 17th century, the curative powers of jade for the various forms of calculi was very generally admitted. A singular instance is offered us in one of Voiture's letters. He was a great sufferer from the stone, and he had received, from a Mademoiselle Paulet, a beautiful jade bracelet. Gracefully acknowledging the receipt of this peculiar gift, he expresses himself in the following frank way, a mixture of indelicacy and gallantry that seems strange to us. Quote, if the stones you have given me do not break mine, they will at least make me bear my sufferings patiently, and it seems to me that I ought not complain of my colic since it has procured me this happiness. End quote. The name used for jade by voiture, Le Jade, supplied a missing link in the derivation of our name jade from the Spanish hijada. When the lady's gift was received by voiture, some friends chanced to be present, and they were disposed to regard it as a token of love, until he assured them that it was only a remedy. It appears that Mademoiselle Paulet was a fellow sufferer, and, alluding to this, voiture writes, on this occasion the jade had for you an effect you did not expect from it, and its virtue defended your own. Renal calculi and poetry do not seem to have much in common, but the following lines freely rendered from an old Italian poem on the subject by Siri de Perse show that even this unpromising theme is susceptible of poetic treatment. Other white stones serve to mark happy days but mine do mark days full of pain and gloom. To build a palace or a temple fair, stones should be used, but mine do serve to wreck the fleshy temple of my soul. Well do I know that death doth wet his glaive upon these stones, and that the marble white that grows in me is there to form my tomb. As jade was, and still is, the most favoured stone in China, although never found within the boundaries of China proper, it was very naturally accorded wonderful medical virtues. An old Chinese encyclopedia, the work of Li She Chan, and presented by him to the Emperor Wan Li of the Ming Dynasty in 1596, contains many interesting notices of jade. 
when reduced to a powder of the size of rice grains, it strengthened the lungs, the heart, and the vocal organs, and prolonged life, more especially if gold and silver were added to the jade powder. Another, and certainly a pleasanter way of absorbing this precious mineral, was to drink what was enthusiastically called the divine liquor of jade. To concoct this elixir, equal parts of jade, rice, and dew water were put into a copper pot and boiled, the resultant liquid being carefully filtered. This mixture was said to strengthen the muscles and make them supple, to harden the bones, to calm the mind, to enrich the flesh, and to purify the blood. Whoever took it for a long space of time ceased to suffer from either heat or cold, and no longer felt either hunger or thirst. Galen, born circa 130 AD, wrote thus of the green jasper. Some have testified to a virtue in certain stones, and this is true of the green jasper, that is to say, this stone aids the stomach and navel by contact. And some, therefore, set the stone in rings and engrave on it a dragon surrounded by rays, according to what King Nechepsos has transmitted to posterity in the fourteenth book of his works. Indeed, I myself have thoroughly tested this stone, for I hung a necklace composed of them about my neck so that they touched the navel, and I received not less benefit from them than I would had they borne the engraving of which Nechepsos wrote. Ruby Sanskrit medical literature, as represented by Naharari, a physician of Kashmir, who wrote in the 13th century, finds in the ruby a valuable remedy for flatulency and biliousness. Moreover, aside from these special uses, an elixir of great potency could be made from rubies by those who properly understood the employment of precious stones in the compounding of medicines. This famous ruby elixir may have had little in common with the stone except its colour, as such remedies were generally said to have been made by some secret and mysterious process, in the course of which all material evidence of the presence of any precious stone or stones completely disappeared. Sapphire One of the earliest specimens of English literature, William Langley's Vision of William Concerning Piers the Ploughman, written about 1377, contains a mention of the sapphire as a cure for disease. I looked on my left half as the lady me thought, and was war of a woman worthily clothed, perfiled with pallure the finest upon earth, ye crowned with a crown the king hath none better. Fetislich like her fingers were fretted with gold wire, and thereon red rubies as red as any glade, and diamonds of dearest price, and double manier sapphires, orientals and ewages, and unimus to destroy. Among the rich gifts offered at the shrine of St. Erkinwald, in Old St. Paul's, was a sapphire given in 1391 by Richard Preston, a citizen and grocer of London. He stipulated that the stone should be kept at the shrine for the cure of diseases of the eyes, and that proclamation should be made of its remedial virtues. St. Erkinwald was the son of Offa, king of the East Saxons, and was converted to Christianity by Melitus, the first bishop of London. In 675 AD, he himself became Bishop of London, being the third to attain that rank after the death of Melitus. His body was interred in the cathedral, and his shrine, which was richly embellished during the reign of Edward III, 1327 to 1377, received many valuable donations. The usefulness of the sapphire as an eye stone for the removal of all impurities or foreign bodies from the eye is noted by Albertus Magnus, who writes that he had seen it employed for this purpose. He adds that when a sapphire was used in this way, it should be dipped in cold water both before and after the operation. This was probably not so much to make the stone colder to the touch as to cleanse it, 
certainly a very necessary proceeding when the same stone was used by many persons suffering from contagious diseases of the eyes. Richard Preston's sapphire appears to have been only one of a class regarded as having special virtue to cure diseased eyes, as is shown by the existence of various other similar sapphires in different parts of Europe. It is not very easy to determine the precise reason, if there be one, which rendered any single sapphire more useful than another in this respect. An entry in the inventory of Charles V notes, an oval oriental sapphire for touching the eyes set in a band of gold. Possibly the fact that a particular gem of this kind was used remedially and was not set for wear as an ornament may have been the only cause for a belief in its special virtue. That a sapphire should have been regarded as especially valuable for the cure of eye diseases serves to illustrate the wide-reaching and persistent influence of Egyptian thought, and the curious transformations through which an originally reasonable idea may pass in the course of time. We have already noted that the sapphire of the ancients was our lapis lazuli, and in the Abas papyrus lapis lazuli is given as one of the ingredients of an eyewash. This ingredient is believed to have originally been the oxide of copper, sometimes called lapis armenus, a material possessing marked astringent properties, and which might be used to advantage in certain morbid conditions of the eye. Lapis lazuli, another blue stone, was later substituted because of its greater intrinsic value, its similarity of color rendering it equally efficacious according to primitive ideas on this subject. When, however, in medieval times the name sapphire came to signify the blue corundum gem known to us by this designation, the special curative virtues of the lapis lazuli were transferred to this still more valuable stone. The proper method of applying a sapphire to cure plague boils is given at some length by Van Helmont. A gem of a fine, deep color was to be selected and rubbed gently and slowly around the pestilential tumor. During and immediately after this operation, the patient would feel but little alleviation, but a good while after the removal of the stone, favorable symptoms would appear, provided the malady were not too far advanced. This, Van Helmont attributes to a magnetic force in the sapphire, by means of which the absent gem continues to extract the pestilential virulency and contagious poison from the infected part. Topaz The use of a topaz to cure dimness of vision is strongly recommended by St. Hildegard. To attain the desired end, the stone was to be placed in wine, and left there for three days and three nights. When retiring to sleep, the patient should rub his eyes with the moistened topaz, so that this moisture lightly touched the eyeball. After the stone had been removed, the wine could be used for five days. A Roman physician of the 15th century was reputed to have wrought many wonderful cures of those stricken by the plague, through touching the plague sores with a topaz, which had belonged to two popes, Clement VI and Gregory II. The fact that this particular topaz had been in the hands of two supreme pontiffs must have added much to the faith reposed in the curative powers of the stone by those upon whom it was used, and this faith may really have helped to hasten their recovery. Bloodstone a historical instance of the use of the bloodstone to check a hemorrhage is recorded in the case of Giorgio Vasari, 1514-1578, the author of The Lives of the Italian Painters of the Renaissance Period. On a certain occasion, when the painter Luca Signorelli, 1439-1521, was placing one of his pictures in a church at Arezzo, Vasari, who was present, was seized with a violent hemorrhage and fainted away. Without a moment's hesitation, Signorelli took from his pocket a bloodstone amulet and slipped it down between Vasari's shoulder blades. The hemorrhage is said to have ceased immediately. 
The bloodstone was used as a remedy by the Indians of New Spain, and Monardes notes that they often cut the material into the shape of hearts. This seems a very appropriate form for an object used to check hemorrhages. The best effect was attained when the stone was first dipped in cold water and then held by the patient in his right hand. Of course, the application of any cold object would serve to congeal the blood, but the connection with the heart vanishes in the direction to place the stone in the right hand. Monardes states that both Spaniards and Indians used the bloodstone in this way. The Franciscan friar Bernardino de Sahagún, a missionary to the Mexican Indians, shortly after the Spanish conquest, writes that in 1576 he cured many natives who were at the point of death from hemorrhage, a result of the plague, by causing them to hold in the hand a piece of bloodstone. By this means he claims to have saved many lives. Robert Boyle, in his Essay about the Origin and Virtues of Gems, London, 1672, pages 177 to 78, tells of a gentleman of his acquaintance who was of a complexion extraordinary sanguine, and was much afflicted with bleeding of the nose. A gentlewoman sent to him a bloodstone, directing him to wear it suspended from his neck, and from the time he put it on, he was no longer troubled with his malady. It recurred, however, if he removed the stone. When Boyle objected that this might be a result of imagination, his friend disposed of his objection by relating the instance of a woman to whom the stone had been applied when she was unconscious from loss of blood. Nevertheless, as soon as it touched her, the flow of blood was checked. Boyle states that this stone did not seem to him to resemble a true bloodstone. It may have been that the cold of the stone congealed the blood, or that the flow was checked by exhaustion. End of chapter 11, part 2 End of The Curious Lore of Precious Stones by George Frederick Kuntz